Politics 101 Introduction This is the face of Gaius Julius Caesar, imprinted on a coin from the era of the early Roman Empire. Julius Caesar was a general in the Roman legions, whom had conquered Western Europe and Southern Britain for the Italian Republic of Rome. In 49 BC, Julius Caesar returned from his conquests to face accusations by his former partner in the First Triumvirate, Pompey, and other enemies in the Roman Senate. By bringing his troops onto Roman soil, he broke the law of the Roman Republic. When Caesar crossed the Rubicon and entered the city of Rome, he uttered the infamous axiom, Alia octa est, meaning, in Latin, the die is cast. Caesar, during his five years as dictator of the Roman government, wrote a new constitution with three main objectives. One, to suppress all armed resistance in the outlying colonies. Two, to create a socially strong centrally Roman nation-state. And three, to make the entirety of lands conquered by Rome into a single cohesive culture. To limit opposition within the Senate to his implementation of his social agenda, Caesar appointed its proponents to positions in the Senate, and to forward the cultural acceptance of his reforms, he passed a series of laws that remade every citizen of the Old Republic into a citizen of the new Empire of Rome. First, Caesar conducted a census, limited sales of luxury items, rewarded citizens with large families for repopulating Italy, abolished all trade guilds and labor unions as political revolutionary clubs, placed a term limit on all provincial governors, and restructured debt laws to abolish repayment of one-fourth of all money owed. He began a massive public works monumental building campaign highly regulated sales of state-subsidized cereal grain food, planned the redistribution of lands to accommodate some 15,000 returning war veterans, reformed the calendar into the essential shape of the form we still use to this day, established a police force, and restructured city laws concerning tax collection methods. When he was killed, he had plans in the works for further monumental building public works projects, as well as two or three enemy nations picked out for possible military expansions. Five years later, General Julius was laid dead by both his friends and enemies alike in the shadowy halls of the Senate building after being declared Imperator for life. His last words were, Et tu, Brute, meaning you tu, Brutus speaking to Marcus Julius Brutus, an optimate senator whom had long before opposed Caesar's first triumvirate. On the Ides of March in the year we now call 49 BC, Caesar died and all his life's ambitious plans were brought to naught. His legacy remains, however, in the saying attributed to Christ regarding the duality of nature and spirit, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. Due to bold debt law reforms made by Julius Caesar, the coinage of Rome increased in value, and what had been a city of bricks became a city of marble, due to the replacement of lead-lined coins with solid gold. Thanks to the senators who assassinated Caesar, he did not live to see these reforms pay off. The imprint emblazoned on this gold coin from the later Roman Empire, the opposite side from the face of Rome's beloved Imperator for life, Gaius Julius Caesar, commemorates his murder at the hands of his enemies in the Senate. The title Emperor of Rome became synonymous with his own name, Caesar, when soon after his death his adopted nephew Octavian defeated Mark Anthony and disestablished the second triumvirate to become the first emperor of Rome and the second Caesar to reign.
Let us consider the symbolic imagery printed on the paper money issued by the USA today. Here we can begin to see the baseless dualism at the foundation for the entire economic dialectic house of cards can be easily eroded away by a simple enough reapplication of understanding of basic social ethics and cultural morals. To begin with, we can see the triplicity inherent in the design between the twin circular seals on either side of the back of a dollar and the slogan for the bill's value in between them. On the left, we have the reverse of America's great seal. On the right, the front side of the same symbol and in between them a slogan. The eye in the pyramid is on the left. The national bird is on the right and between them is printed the word one. Above this word we find in small print a pledge of our nation to the single deity of conceptual monotheism, the slogan, In God We Trust. While this may seem an innocuous enough slogan to find on money in a nation founded by supposed monotheists, it expresses an explicit conceit that results in pitting one monotheist person against another over the definition of, and thus existence of, an otherwise shared monotheist concept. This causes conflict between Christianity and Islam over the issue of the Hebrew faith in the same form of contest as that between Cain and Abel for the favor of their father, Adam's God. In truth, democracy is founded on an autonomy from religious beliefs, and thus to pledge allegiance to one nation under one God is to divide the nation's government against itself. If the separation of church and state is not sacrosanct, both must be held in doubt. The statement, In God We Trust, being printed on our nation's money, makes it appear as though citizenship in our democratic government dependent on our religious belief in a monotheist concept of God. This is, however, the opposite of the truth in this case. Democracy is based on rule by a plurality, as opposed to rule by a single deity as in the monotheist concept. But this form of using religious language to blaspheme the best form of fair government is not new. So to see such a slanderous slogan appear on paper cash is so ironic we accept it as divinely ordained. It is not. Nor is the God referred to on money, the same God conceived of by the triple children of the Western monotheist traditions. The God meant by the word being placed in the context of being on money is, as taught by the great teachers of the monotheist religious traditions, closest to the monotheist concept of the devil. The devil, called Satan in all three monotheist traditions today, is symbolized by the evil eye, called the Ujat, Molech, or Malachio, of the great beast of ten heads and seven horns, called Tumegatherion, whose gematria is 666, the same as the sum of the sun, magic number square of Sorath, who is both Satan, the blind demiurge father, and Lucifer, the fallen antichrist son. Although the slogan below the cryptic graphic is discussed too often, the meaning of the first part of this banner, etched in an arc above the design, is even known to only a few. The slogan on the banner below is Latin and means New World Order. However, what is unknown to many is that the word translated world, which is rendered as seclorum in Latin, means secular as opposed to temporal, both terms denoting levels of power invented by the Catholic Church long after Latin ceased being a spoken language in a common dialect. Thus, originally speaking in Latin, no such word as seclorum existed. It was an invention of the church to distinguish the authority of kings from that of the pope. State governmental power they dubbed secular. 
and religious authority derived from temporal power. The slogan above this diagram depicting the devil, which completes the meaning of the too often misunderstood slogan on the banner below, is also in the language of Latin, however is not lay Latin, but proper, because it quotes from Virgil's epic the Aeneid. This originally Greek saying is quoted only partially and out of context here, and applied to a different subject, rather than in its original context. It is put here into amplifying the meaning of the phrase related to it below, New World Order. The phrase above is, in Latin, Enuit Cryptis, and means fortune favors. The original Greek saying was, fortune favors the bold. The meaning in this depiction's context is that fortune favors the New World Order. Likewise, the meaning of fortune as fate in the original context is replaced by the implication of money as fortune printed on paper cash. Thus, the picture of the Great Satan, or Whore of Babylon, is shown as encircled by the pronouncement, Money favors the New World Order. That this meaning appears to be emblazoned on our modern currency is, again, too little of a shock to most complacent and conditioned U.S. citizens today, because to any student of basic civic history class in the USA, the phrase, New World, denotes to us now what the phrase, New Atlantis, once meant to Roger Bacon, or the idea of the American colonies as an apparatus for conducting a great experiment in democracy, as suggested by modern Masonic author M.P. Hall. Even from the point of view of the modern CFR Big New Brzezinski's grand chessboard, the New World of the USA sits in the center as the great bastion of hope for a global hegemony to dominate the rest of the globe. Thus, to the common or average person on the street, this slogan is meant to denote that the old world of Europe takes its military commands as marching orders from the new world of the USA. Those who have studied the subtle suggestions in this symbol's graphic design towards such banal and unquestioningly ignorant generalizations such as these commonly misconceive them as applicable to the majority of the masses, who they are misled to believe are simple sheep being led to a slaughter by such subliminal messages as these unquestionably are. They believe they know a deeper measure of meaning, a larger scale, a higher point than the rest. Let us examine their reasoning for thinking in this way. The thirteen steps of the pyramid symbolize the thirteen original colonies and the date, in Roman numerals, 1776, symbolizes the date of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, as well as that as the founding in Bavaria of Adam Weishaupt's Perfectibilist Illuminati, or Order of Illuminated Seers. Never mind yet that if this date had any sinister implication, it would be in its relation between the Mundi and Lux calendars of the Church and of Freemasons, or between this and the concept of this date on the Farsi, lunar pre-Muslim Hajj-dated calendar used by Weishaupt in the Illuminati. The architecture of the pyramid structure inspired the caste system described by Plato in his records of Critias's accounting of Atlantis to Socrates in his Republic. This work, beloved by early Catholic Neoplatonists, inspired the City on a Hill of St. Anselm, Christianopolis by Cretan de Troy, and The New Atlantis by Roger Bacon, as well as being, at the time of the Founding Fathers' drafting of the U.S. Constitution, a Masonic craft tool, the Beehive, symbol of the industriousness of a hive mind populated by neuter drones, that had been adopted by Napoleon as a symbol of his hopes for a French empire. 
In the class hierarchy envisioned by Plato in his Republic, slaves are the base, serfs the middle class, and philosopher kings reign over and above all. The Christian symbol for God, the all-seeing eye in a triangular halo, hovers over the base symbolizing the missing capstone motif present in contemporary Masonic rituals. In Masonic lore, the lecture signified that the stone the builders rejected was the missing capstone, not of a pyramid, but of the royal arch of the Temple of Solomon. Again, the symbol for Christ as the stone the builders rejected is here replaced with a contrary meaning symbol depicting the usurpation by the Catholic Trinity concept of the monotheist God over the work of Pharaoh's slaves in ancient Egypt under world home of the dead. However, the eye in the triangle atop the pyramid with no capstone motif is not a valid Christian symbol for God, not even for the Catholic concept of the Trinity. Because it has three corner tips, three inner angles, three side lines, and is an equilateral triangle, one able to have interior corner angles up to 90 degrees each, and then only on a spherical surface, it can be a symbol of the Trinity and thus of the triune nature of the Divine Godhead. However, because the all-seeing eye is peeking through this halo, presumably from a heaven beyond the mere veiling it from our own world, it constitutes a fourth trait, which combines with the Trinity to imply that God is not of a triune nature, as Catholicism stipulates, but is actually an idolatrous image signifying on a flat plane space the implication into our own realm in the 3D world of an imaginary point where none exists, rising above the triangle at the height of the eye to form a conceptual tetrahedron. The iris of the all-seeing eye, commonly called the eye of providence, is peculiar in this depiction from its depiction in any other source, be it a Catholic faith painting of the Last Supper by Erasmus, or on the folded overflap on the Freemasonic apron of America's first president. In the regard that the iris is not depicted realistically, we can propose thus it is not meant as an image glorifying the enrapturement of man's mind by thoughts of God, but as an icon signifying something removed from reality by imaginative symbolism, relegating the potential beautitude of its art to a mere pop logo of 200-year pre-data surrealist expressionism. The iris, as we can see here in this extreme magnification of the image, shown on the back of every single U.S. $1 Federal Reserve note printed since 1936, is comprised of three concentric circles. The real meaning of these three concentric circles, replacing the ordinary patterns of the iris, of the all-seeing eye of God, is not known. They are not present in the original designs for the reverse side of the new U.S. nation's Great Seal. However, by the time the final galley proof was approved for printing of the symbol onto the back of the first pressed U.S. $1 Federal Reserve notes with it on them in around 1935, the eye had an iris of three concentric circles. This detail of the picture is so small in the printed version of it on our paper cache that almost everyone would likely overlook it and not see it at all, ever. However, to those aware of it, its originally intended meaning can only be speculated upon. Some believe it to be an Illuminati addition to the motif, meant to appeal toward the three degrees of Blue Lodge masonry as signifying three steps up toward the pupil of the eye, symbolizing the lodge door, leading to an age of gold and enlightenment. Here we see the pupil of the eye shown on money that supposedly depicts the eye of the one true, universally known and generally accepted monotheist concept of God, the eye itself has a placid, calm, 
complacent, and serene glint that causes it to appear lazy, slackened, flaccid, and tired. The eye appears like that of the oriental tankas of Buddha achieving nirvana. It transcends enlightenment. It encompasses serenity. The fact the ink used to print this image on money is green is no grave mistake either. Green's negative influences range only as deeply afield as jealousy and greed, while its highest levels of mental stimulation of subconscious inspiration are at most lust towards vegetative photosynthesis. Green is the central, neutral, or hermaphroditic color on the rainbow spectrum, and the balance in it of blue to yellow determines its ability to feed on light rays and thus leech also off our own brain waves. This image of a window to the soul of our supposed God printed on the back of cash is a wormhole through which the value of our money evaporates. Yet the half-dark, half-light, yin-yang-esque pupil of the green all-seeing eye in the triangle atop the 13-step pyramid printed as the reverse Great Seal of the USA on the back of a $1 Federal Reserve note is only one side of the depiction of this great beast of the Christian apocalypse by St. John of Patmos, here rendered as a blasphemy to the monotheist concept of a one true God. The other shows us the national bird, the bald eagle, holding in its talons on our right the thirteen weapons of war, called by Shakespeare in Hamlet the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, and in the talons on our left the thirteen-petaled olive branch offered to Noah as a gift from God by the dove he sent out to find land from the ark after the flood, symbolizing peace. Just as the reverse of the great seal is labeled the great seal, on the reverse of the one dollar bill. So too is the front of the great seal on the back of the one dollar bill labeled of the United States. The pyramid symbol is labeled the great seal and the eagle is labeled of the United States to symbolize the autonomous authority of a sovereign individual of one over the other. The great seal or pyramid is subliminally dominant in to the eagle, which also faces to our left the location on the back of the bill where the pyramid is. However, the pyramid symbolizes the god of money and the eagle the state power of the USA. The eagle's wings are upraised in flight and its torso concealed behind a shield comprised of 13 vertical and 13 horizontal stripes again symbolizing the 13 original colonies to ratify the American Declaration of Independence from Great Britain. In its beak it grips a banner reading E Pluribus Unum, the Latinization of the saying popularized in the Enlightenment-era rationalist Alexandre Dumas' novel about the decades earlier revolution in France to overthrow Louis XVI, the Man in the Iron Mask, where it was the battle cry of his fictionalized version of the contemporary musketeers. E pluribus unum, also not an authentically Latin saying in its original use, means all for one, and from the battle cry of the musketeers goes in its complete context all for one and one for all. The eagle, as it appears here, is exactly identical to the symbol on the seal for the executive branch of the U.S. government in every detail except for one, shown here, but absent from the seal of the commander-in-chief. The star made out of smaller stars, i.e. a constellation, above the eagle is, again, purely expressionistic symbolism and not meant to symbolize any real constellation in the North or South Hemisphere. It is in the form of a hexagram pattern comprised of 13 smaller pentagon stars within its constellation system. The 13 pentagrams most probably symbolize the 13 founding colonies of the USA 
and their arrangement as pentagrams into the pattern of a hexagram is an unmistakably Masonic artistic device used to signify the microchasm of pentacles within the macrocosmos, or hexagram, alike the many souls of the one spirit, again traits attributed to the one true God. This stellation is amended to by 28 outward radiating in four quadrants of seven each lines signifying its emanating light. The next aspect of this diagram outlining in clear plain sight the body and tongue of the great beast significant of Satan to those who worship money is the head of the American national emblem a male bald eagle. The masculinity of the eagle is a symbol of the national spirit's virility. Its glare supposedly our military's acute attentivity and its strength supposedly symbolic of the potential for a combined focus of effort by the whole American population. However, the upturned feather at the back of the eagle's brow is symbolic not of the eagle nor any trait of its own, but is meant to be morally reminiscent to the fable of the fiery phoenix by hinting at the U.S. potential contemporary to the minting of this image on money for developing nuclear atom-splitting bomb technology. The original confusion of the eagle and phoenix began in Dark Age painted art by alchemists. The parable of the one bird with two heads, one fledged with feathers, and the other bald, without any feathers yet grown in, traces back to the earliest depictions of the double-headed eagle motif used first by the Habsburgs and Romanovs of Bulgaria and Russia, then by the House of Rothschild, and finally adopted as a symbol of the 32nd right status of Scottish right free and accepted masonry. The role of the eagle hinting at the dual nature of the hawk or phoenix firebird symbol is because the hawk is the dual heads of the Habsburg family. The bald eagle of the Scottish Rite Freemasons' highest degrees, the vulture, raven or turkey hawk, the heads of the Romanovs' clan, and so on and so forth. Thus the bald eagle signifying the unfledged nation arising in power, alike a phoenix from the ashes of war and peace, is also only symbolic in a larger, older set of alphabetic symbols of our own fledgling nation's military might. This great beast chosen as our national leviathan, from the zodiac of all possible choices, holds forth the banner stating, All for one, before a constellation shaped like the Star of David, seen later on the flag of Israel, comprised of pentagrams, often associated with Satanism, or with the U.S. Pentagon military headquarters. Having now seen the symbolic paths taken by the dual eyes of Satan and Moloch on the back of the one dollar bill, we can now examine the third aspect in this triangular dialectic, the first man on top of the entire worldwide occult network pyramid, George Washington. Just as the eye atop the pyramid symbolized the way of the civilizer and the eagle symbolized the way of the warrior, so does George Washington symbolize the way of the wanderer in this triumvirate of transcendentalist mind-state motives for socializing motion. While the warrior ignites off the civilizer's fuel below, the transcendentalist philosopher king floats above them like ash in their hot air. But who was George Washington? Was he really the first transcendentalist philosopher king in St. Anselm's City of God, in Roger Bacon's New Atlantis? What is the significance to modern history of his indirect relationship to Adam Weishaupt? What secrets of U.S. national history remain buried alike the bones of this man, and how many others have been, like him, so pivotal to the providence of history showing any light at all upon the topic of U.S. democracy? Because if George Washington had been a bad man and turned out to have surplus skeletons in his closet, then democracy could have easily been done away with as soon as he died. 
However, it is a credit to his honor that it has survived, even at the meager 200 and a few years as it has since it passed from Washington's hands to ours, that is, to we the people of the United States of America. If one blemish remains to blot the soul's window of this one man, then the whole occupation of democracy and the pursuit of a more free and less restraining form of self-government could well have been written off entirely. So we must be very careful in how we choose to judge this man's soul as we seek to weigh it against evil incarnate in the form of his proverbial opponent's twin eyes upon the very point of the all-seeing eye in the triangle atop the pyramid with no capstone on the back of the one dollar bill. The back of the one dollar bill is thus virtually graffiti coated in evil and satanic symbolism. Does this make the opposite side's implication meaning that George Washington, the first U.S. president, was good, equally valid? Perhaps those lucky enough to have voted and elected Washington their first president simply saw him, then, exactly as we see our own, now, 44 on down the line, that is, as the lesser of two evils, where the other is comprised of the political and religious leviathan symbolic of Satan. So can we use our knowledge of history to establish from a cursory examination of the intentions of the founding fathers of American democracy, whether the USA has it, it in its spirit to ever become a total dictatorship, beneath an utter power-mad tyrant? Can there be such a thing as a Caesar over the form of our own modern politics? Past Politics 101A A History in Symbols The popularity of Julius Caesar prevented the senators who later killed him from being able to resist first proclaiming him imperator for life. The popularity of Caesar's reforms to debt laws had made most Roman citizens very wealthy, and those who had carried Caesar's face on lead-lined coins when he came to power were carrying around gold coins when he was murdered by a conspiracy of jealous old-money senators. Brutus, the one to deliver the death blow, was himself an optimata opposed to the first triumvirate of Julius Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus. But the concept of the triumvirate did not die with Octavius, Julius Caesar's adopted nephew, following his dissolution of the second triumvirate consisting of himself, Mark Antony, and Lepidus. Because those who supported the assassination of Caesar saw the time between the end of his first triumvirate and the beginning of the second triumvirate formed by Caesar Octavian as pierced through the midpoint by their successful conspiracy to murder him. Those who supported and continued to support the assassination of anyone who would become ruler of the whole world saw their deed as an omen of future events yet to come. By the time of the murder of Jesus, called the Christ, by the Jerusalem Sanhedrin, by the permission of Roman procurator Pontius Pilate, which followed the turn of the millennium and the eon by nearly the same duration afterwards as did nominal years one occur following the event of Caesar's assassination. Those who conspired to kill any potential kings of the world who could attempt to arise had already adopted the triumvirate model as their own and formed a group dedicated to ruling the world. To make the political figure of Jesus into an example to any and all future would-be teachers of self-sovereignty who refused to bow before the Caesar over all the world, the group of conspirators who had plotted out the political impact of Julius Caesar's murder and who had seen the religious implications of the murder of Jesus Christ fulfilled, this group has systematically twisted and perverted the words of the historical person of Jesus 
by marginalizing his message beside the story of his murder as the basic premise for the faith of Christianity. Thus, the original symbol of the earliest followers of Jesus after the crucifixion, the ichthos, or Greek symbol of Pisces, the geometrically vesica-shaped fish logo, had to be supplanted with and replaced by a symbol determined by his killers themselves. However, they knew that, because they could not symbolize the message of their own faith to early Christians with the gruesome abuse and grisly slaughter of their ritual sacrifice of the Lamb of Peace by the traditional emblem of the crucifix itself, bedecked by the bloodied body of their Savior. It thus fell to the Roman Emperor Constantine, in his role as high priest of the Roman Flamines, colleges built around temples to the seven Olympic gods of Rome, to choose a symbol for the new religion that was seeking his approval to be accepted as a new school of Roman religion, the Christian Church in Rome. This branch of early Christianity, founded by Peter, one of the twelve apostles of Christ, and called Catholic or Universal Christianity, appealed to Emperor Constantine by offering him and all subsequent Caesars of Rome the title of Pope, meaning Father, in the Roman Catholic Christian Church. His suggestion was the Chi Rho, formed as a logogram by combining two Greek letters, Chi as K, and Rho as R, which he had supposedly seen in a vision on the battlefield. Its meaning, he proposed, was, In this sign you shall conquer, pronounced in Latin as, In hoc signo vinces. Constantine's vision never became the official symbol of the Christian religion. However, by subsequent pressure exerted on the churches centered in other regions, eventually the Catholic denomination came to dominate the doctrines and dogma of the entire faith of Christendom. As such, Caesar, called only Pope, following the final sacking of Rome by the Goths and Arabs from 410 to 846 AD, continued to reign as the Emperor of Christendom, the religious kingdom of all Christians, even after the dissolution of the official Roman Empire. By supplanting the pantheist religions of Rome with monotheist Christianity, the conspiracy of king killers effectively replaced the symbol of Jesus with the symbol of the cross as the dominant symbol of Christianity. The cross symbol signifies death, as opposed to the fish emblem signifying life, and as such is a motif used by the inheritors of the conspiracy to kill Caesar ever since to signify their own empowerment over the minds of all Christians. However, the lessons taught by the words of Jesus himself remain incomprehensible to the mindsets of those who, to this day, control the world's largest single monotheist religious empire. The Pope, today, is merely a figurehead serving the whims and dictates of a group that lurks behind the cloth, in the shadow of death in the dark night of the soul, beneath the foot of the cross. The triumvirate assassins had replaced the office of Caesar with officers loyal only to them, and the title of Caesar had been replaced by the title of Pope by the beginning of the Dark Ages, when the Pope ruled from Rome over the kings and their vassals in Europe, and where the kings taxed and the vassals owned the serfs who were the European peoples originally conquered by Caesar and converted to citizens of Rome. The symbol used by the earliest Christians to signify their loyalty to the message of Jesus was replaced by the symbol of the cross, used to signify the state authority that had crucified Jesus over the rights of his followers, the early Christians. Likewise, the logogram of Constantine, the Cairo or Constantine cross, was replaced by the cross autograph of Charlemagne, the first ruler of the Holy Roman Empire, considered the king of Europe, answerable as second only to the Pope of Roman Christendom. 
by the lifetime of Charles the Bald, the grandson of Charlemagne, the cross had become completely dominant as the symbol of power in all Christendom. Here we see the shield of Charles the Bald, showing a red cross on a white field, symbolizing the blood of the innocent, with a golden crown at the crux, signifying Christ as the king over all Christians. Despite the Roman Catholic Pope having gained the loyalty of the Holy Roman Emperors of Europe, Christendom had been divided into the Western Roman Catholic Empire and the Orthodox Church of Greece, which ruled Eastern Christendom from Constantinople. When Constantinople was threatened by Ottoman Turks in the late 11th century, the Pope launched the Crusades, sending countless noblemen and serfs to die in a vain attempt to crush the Muslim Arab natives of the Holy Land and replace their population with Christian Europeans. The noblemen and serfs sent into the Holy Lands on the First Crusade retook Jerusalem and established themselves as the order of knights called the Hospitallers. The Hospitaller Knights' patrons were doctors. However, by the time of the plagues in Europe, the Church stopped being the primary care provider of medicine to the people of Europe, and the military order of knights had split into two trends, one the military order itself, and the other the practice of medicine. The symbol for doctors of medicine nowadays is commonly familiar as the caduceus, or snake wrapped around a staff, symbolizing Asclepius, son of Hermes, and founder of modern medicine according to legends of the Greek Golden Age. The caduceus staff of Asclepius is shown in modern symbols of medicine as upon a blue Constantine cross. The presence of the Constantine cross symbol at the period in time when the Hospitaller Knights were becoming the association of independent doctors practicing medicine across Europe alarmed the conspirators whose figurehead was the Roman Catholic Pope. However, what alarmed them more than the presence of the Constantine cross in the symbol of the unaffiliated practice of medicine was the presence of the cow disease. This was a symbol new to their control system because it came from somewhere outside of it. It symbolized the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the form of the crucified serpent, the creature who sheds its skin to die and be reborn again. The triumvirate of conspirators in power behind the scenes of the Catholic Church and European politics of the early Dark Ages were deeply concerned by the Hospitaller Knights, concepts being brought back from the Muslim, Hebrew, and Gnostic Holy Land into Christian Europe by the returning soldiers of the Crusades. Ideas such as private ownership of medical practices were not to their liking. So, in the late 12th century AD, these conspirators sent the Knights Templar, adjunct to the Priory of Zion, to investigate the origins for the knowledge of Asclepius's caudices brought back by the Hospitallers. The Knights Templar were successful in learning the Gnostic origins of the Hospitallers' beliefs and transmitted their findings to the Pope, who then had the order forcibly expunged in the Albigensian heresy at the beginning of the Inquisition, meant to purge Europe of heretical and anti-Christian pagan beliefs such as Gnosticism. The Knights Templar were sent to the occupied Holy Land to seek the origin for the Asclepian influence of the Christian hospital or Knights. The Constantine cross of the modern medical practice symbol was considered to have implied their knowledge of the true holders of power in Christendom at that time, and to imply the shift in trend from seeing the Pope as Emperor of Christendom towards seeing the Pope as merely the contemporary continuation of Caesar over Rome. The Templars traced the origin of influence on the Hospitaller's symbolism 
of the Caudice's staff of Asclepius to the faith of Christian Gnosticism in the Holy Land. Christian Gnostics in the Holy Land appeared to have preserved the apocrypha and pseudepigraphal writings of Egyptian Copts and Hebrew Essenes from contemporary to the life of Jesus without being influenced to adopt the Septuagint Gospels of the Latin Vulgate imposed in European Christendom since the era of Constantine. The Gnostics considered that the Christ worshipped by Catholicism a degeneration of symbolism signifying the influence of the Demiurge, the Gnostic equivalent to the concept of Satan. Thus, the serpent symbolized Christ as Satan. For their loyal learning of the Gnostic beliefs for the Pope, the Pope in turn dissolved the Knights Templar order, divested them of their property, rewarding it in turn to the remaining hospitallers to remilitarize them as the Knights of Malta, and burn the remaining Templars as heretics. So began the Catholic Inquisition against Satanism and pagan witchcraft in Europe. The Knights Hospitallers were combined with the Knights Templar into the Knights of Malta. The Knights of Malta are still around now, at the turn of the 21st century. They remain in order strictly loyal to the Catholic Papacy, though they admit Protestant members as well, and have a permanent member status at the UN. The Knights of Malta were allowed to survive only because they remained loyal to the Pope who, in turn, answered to the triumvirate of conspirators who really held power. This triumvirate exercised the Inquisition in order to purge the last pagan faiths from organized practice in Europe. However, they could not prevent the loss of medical practice to the private sector due to a shift in economic management that occurred as a result of the European plague, the Black Death, toward the end of the Inquisition. So what the conspirators wanted was to examine the Asclepian tradition's original method of influence on the minds of returning crusaders who had been exposed to Christian Gnosticism while on tour of duty in the Holy Land. They had preserved the military order of the Hospitallers, but had largely lost the practice of medicine to the private sector, and they wanted to know exactly how the Asclepian tradition had caused this. Knowing that Hermes was the father of Asclepius, and having learned from the Inquisition that the cult of alchemists worshipped Hermes Trismegistus, the conspirators wanted to know exactly how the Greek cult of Hermes had influenced the European Gnostics via the Asclepian tradition's influence on the Hospitallers. They needed a European Gnostic to study the meaning of the Caudice's staff of Hermes Trismegistus and to discern the meaning of its dual entwined serpents. To accomplish this goal, the conspirators remotely guided the developing interests of Englishman Dr. John Dee. Dee founded an order of hermetic alchemists who studied the practical scientific applications of contemporary metallurgy toward creating a symbolic alphabet to interpret the pagan religion and translate it into Christian monotheism. The original results were the tarot cards resulting from Dee's study of the hieroglyphic monad symbol of Hermes as the alchemical elementary metal mercury. But Dr. Dee himself was no fool. Living around the turn of the 17th century, he was well educated on the history of Christianity and saw the cross of Constantine as alive and well in the minds and hearts of the modern papal Catholics of Rome. He disapproved of the Crusades and the Inquisition and was among the Reformation-era Protestants of England who called themselves Anglican and who were loyal to the King of England as the head of the Church of England, and who did not answer to the authority of the Catholic denomination of the Christian Church in Rome under the Pope. Dr. D. also studied the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha of the Middle Eastern religions, and came to the conclusion that Roman Catholicism 
had indeed been used to marginalize the moral importance of the words of Jesus himself. He believed it was the substance of these apocryphal teachings that was the cause of the split between the hospitallers in Jerusalem into the independent schools of medicine run by his lifetime as state universities. As such, he quickly realized that the conspirators behind the Roman Catholic Pope of his day were the same who had conspired to assassinate Jesus under the state-authorized power of Rome, as well as those in the Roman Senate who had conspired to assassinate Julius Caesar. Knowing the assassin guild within Roman Catholic Christendom controlled the state authority of the Pope, D. realized his knowledge of the Gnostic Apocrypha to the public in coded format to protect his own life. The conspirators themselves learned a great amount from the work of Dr. D. However, ultimately the greatest threat to their secret authority ever posed evolved from the cult of Hermes formed by Dr. D. Dr. D's Hermetic Order formed the roots of European Rosicrucianism, an anti-papal faith underlying the Reformation era's radical changes to Christian religious doctrine and dogma begun by Martin Luther that swept across Europe following the Inquisition. The secret society of hermetic anti-papists behind the Rosicrucian faith eventually evolved from the survivors of the Templar Purge and, during the Inquisition, had reorganized as the private trade unions and workers' guilds building the Gothic cathedrals of Europe called Stone Masons. Dr. D's Hermetic Order revealed the meaning of the Caudices of Hermes was the knowledge of double helix DNA by ancient Egyptian magician doctors, and this effectively reduced to rubble the significance to all intervening history of the Roman Catholic Empire of Christendom. Dr. D's Order represented the final split between the original private practitioners of medicine begun during the First Crusade from the state authority of the Pope of Rome. By the time Dee's original Invisible College of Rosicrucians became the Royal Society for the Study of the Natural Sciences in England, the decline of the era of papal authority signified by the cross had begun. Eventually, the goal of this endeavor was to replace the Roman Catholic concept of Christianity with the Gnostic concept, which had a completely different mythology, cosmology, doctrine, and religious dogma than the Catholic faith invented by the Roman Christian Caesars. It was believed by the earliest Crusaders, the Hospitallers, the Knights Templars, Dr. D. himself, the Rosicrucians, and the earliest craft guilds of speculative masons, that the message of the original words of the historical person of Jesus revealed that he, himself, was a Gnostic. This concept of Jesus not being a Roman Catholic came at the same time as the discovery by Christopher Columbus of a European trade route to North America, and the result was the final overthrow of the symbol of the cross as a symbol for papal power over Europe. The rosy cross symbol of Dr. D's Rosicrucian faith, hermetic secret society, reflected the resurrection of the meaning of Jesus as central to the symbolism and meaning of the Christian cross symbol, and embodied the serpent symbol in the fang-like saying, that every rose has its thorn. Thus, the conspirators of the assassin triumvirate, who had held power for centuries through the papal authority over Christendom from Rome, were forced to face the moral lesson they refused to learn by sacrificing Jesus and marginalizing his words and their meaning. Dr. D's Rosicrucian Hermetic Secret Society of Speculative Masons became dedicated to overturning the authority of the Pope 
just as the original triumvirate of assassins had dedicated themselves to the cause of overturning the authority of Caesar. Thus, the Rosicrucian religious faith begun by Dr. D's Hermetic Secret Society was contrary to the Catholic faith in the Pope of Rome as the supreme king of Christendom, however professed itself at the time to be an invisible college because it sought to avoid the sort of persecution suffered by the Templars. Because of this anti-papist stance, many Old Templars and families of Old Templar Knights and their founding order, the Priory of Zion, were eager to form a real and working secret order to advocate the Rosicrucian religious faith. By targeting the domination over the faith of Christianity in the empire of Roman Christendom by the Pope, the Hermetic Templar Rosicrucians, who formed Freemasonry, were attempting to topple the authority behind the Pope of the conspiracy of assassins that had held sway since the original assassination of Julius Caesar. Dr. D's Hermetic Templar Rosicrucian Freemasons' answer to the secret conspirators' authority was to replace the religion of Roman Catholicism with the religion of Christian Gnosticism. Their goal was to replace the plain, empty cross as the dominant symbol of Christianity, with a symbol that would signify also the importance of the person who was crucified on that cross, whom was the original founder of the religion, killed by the secret conspiracy to be persecuted for his Gnostic beliefs. Thus, the rose cross symbol shows the five-petal rose mounted at the center of a golden Christian cross surrounded by four green thorns on a circular field of white. The five-petal rose was a symbol of man as having two legs, two arms, and a head. The green thorn symbolized the fangs of the serpent symbol of Gnosticism. The cross was of gold to signify the wealth of Rome, and the colors of the red rose and white circle repeated the original Templar symbolism of blood and innocence. Dr. D's original hieroglyphic monad symbol, signifying man as a symbol for alchemical elemental metal mercury, equivalent to Greek Hermes, showed simultaneously the image of a human as two legs, two arms, and a head, and of Christ with the head surmounted by a dual-horned crown, also signifying the contemporary mistranslation of rays from his head as horns of Moses. This made the cross emblem of the upper torso on Dr. D's hieroglyphic monad symbol secondary in significance to the symbol's meaning as Hermes Trismegistus, and thus effectively shifted the center of Christian symbolism from the cross toward the Hermetic Caudice's serpent symbol of Gnosticism. Dr. D's esoteric order's answer to the papal loyalist Catholic Knights of Malta was to militarize into an efficient hierarchy the orders of remnant non-Maltese Knights, who would then spread the message as a secret society of the Gnostic faith of an anti-papist Rosicrucianism. The result of this was free and accepted masonry, which practiced speculative philosophical sciences at the end of the Dark Ages and beginning of the Renaissance, and which formed all the great round-table think-tank groups of the day who studied and practiced science and who would usher in the Age of Reason. The Age of Reason posed an immense threat to the power of the Assassin's Conspiracy, and they found themselves facing what has since come to be called the Crisis of Democracy. They saw the power of their state authority, symbolized by the Christian cross, slipping away and being replaced by the Gnostic notions of self-government, sovereign liberty, and inalienable human rights endowed by a divine creator. These Gnostic concepts strongly influenced the original thinking 
of the founders of Freemasonry, who saw religion as a battlefield between the concept of the cross and the concept of the man upon it, or between the serpent and an unhatched egg. By the mid-18th century, Rosicrucian Freemasons had staged political revolutions in almost every nation in Europe and successfully replaced the royal rulers of these countries who remained loyal to the Pope in Rome with democracies formed of popularly elected public officials representative of the masses of the populace. Thus, around this time period, the goal of replacing the cross as a symbol of the religious authority of the Roman Catholic Pope with the serpent as a symbol of the personal sovereignty of each individual man became a battle between competing political ideologies as well. Eventually, these notions of Gnosticism became so entrenched in Rosicrucian Christianity that the concept of Roman papal authority became weakened and was in danger of being completely replaced by the ideals of the religion of Gnosticism. The serpent appears chopped into pieces in this warning sign from the era of the American Revolution, symbolizing the weakness of the British colonies in America, separated and implying their strength if united into a single political body. Later, following the successful revolution in the British colonies for American independence from British rule, the symbol of the snake appears again, resurrected, its cut-apart segments now recombined, emblazoned with a warning not to tempt the wrath of the powerful, unified, United States of America. The original flag of the United States was sewn by Martha Washington, the wife of the first U.S. President, George Washington, during the American Revolutionary War, and depicted the 13 British colonies in America as 13 white stars in a circle on a blue field in the upper left corner of a field crossed vertically by 13 stripes, 6 white symbolizing innocence, and 7 red symbolizing blood. The flag of the United States now is changed very little from its original design, having instead of 13 colonies, the current 50 U.S. states symbolized as white stars in the blue field in the upper left. The stripes still signify our national spirit of pride, and the stars still signify our national spirit of duty. The various revolutionary wars across Europe but particularly the war for American independence from Britain, were costing the assassination conspirators more than merely their religious authority through the Pope being diminished in favor of states' rights to self-govern and seek as goals the ideals of democracy. The attitude of the Freemason Jacobin revolutionaries was costing the elite conspiracy money. Knowing they had to formulate a plan quickly to deal with killing off the serpent symbol of Gnosticism, the contemporary triumvirate conspiracy needed someone who could fill the role that Dr. John Dee had for religion, only instead for the field of politics. They needed someone who could create a new cult, one that they could control. They found their patsy in Dr. Adam Weishaupt, a Bavarian professor of canon law teaching in Ingolstadt. He had been raised a Jesuit, loyal to the Pope, but had been exposed to Gnostic idealism and become a typical pro-democracy liberal of the Age of Reason. The conspirators took his model of a secret society, called the Perfectibilists of Bavaria, and formed from it a new cult, designed to penetrate the Freemasons, and expose their plans to the conspirators so that the conspirators could then control the Masons. This cult was cursorily expelled from Bavaria under the name Illuminati, and has served the will of the conspirators who control all world events from behind the scenes to pose a fake threat to their hegemony in the form 
of a so-called conspiracy to overthrow all governments and religions, first of Europe and later the whole world. By posing as the underdog cult themselves, the conspirators of the Assassin's Triumvirate cast popular suspicion on Masonic Jacobins and effectively reversed the trend they had begun toward liberal democratic revolutions against papal loyal monarchies. The goal of the Bavarian Illuminati was professed in a work called The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion to be the destruction of all states' national sovereignty followed by the implementation of global rule by a single tyrant appointed by the conspirators themselves. The Illuminati of Bavaria next provided the contemporary Rosicrucian cults in the Freemasonic secret societies with a shocking new piece of historical evidence in the form of the Golden Dawn cipher manuscripts. These cipher manuscripts, apparently copies of originals made during the era of John Dee's first construction of the Hermetic Templar Rosicrucians into a secret society, imply the Golden Dawn rituals as the original rituals practiced by the first Freemasons. The Golden Dawn rituals were implemented into practice by a group of Hermetic Rosicrucian Templar Freemasons, and they retained their ties to their founders from Germany who had provided the cipher manuscripts, i.e. the contemporary Bavarian Illuminati of the Assassin's Triumvirate conspiracy. The Triumvirate hoped, by infiltrating Masonry as the Illuminati to the very esoteric and occult-most depths of its secret society's hidden hierarchy, they could reform the goals of Freemasons from those of the pro-democracy liberal Jacobins to those loyal to the conspiracy's goals of a global hegemony under one king. Just as they had, one aeon before, subverted the message of the words of Jesus Christ until his person meant nothing more than their ritual sacrifice to the state authority of Rome, so now they hoped to remold the message of masonry into one loyal to their own power. The triumvirate conspirators knew they needed a new form of symbol, like the cross, to replace the symbolism of the serpent used by Gnostics. They knew they needed a modern version of Emperor Constantine to propose such a radical concept, and they knew they had a loyal group of Masonic occultists in the form of the Golden Dawn group. Beginning in the earliest years of the 20th century, the triumvirate conspiracy of assassins replaced the symbol of the Rosicrucian faith based on Gnostic Christianity and Hermetic anti-papistry with a much more complex alphabet of symbols derived from alchemical tarot. The Golden Dawn worked with the so-called Enochian magic system of Dr. John D. and created a new form of model for it. They modernized all the occult symbolism of the esoteric traditions and mystery schools. They popularized the practice of magic in the mainstream of the public media and they generally opened the door for control of the occult network of remaining Jacobins by the secret conspirators. The conspirators had no intention of losing control over their empire, simply due to the threat to absolute papal monarchism by the crisis of democracy. While cultivating the Golden Dawn as an occult esoteric mystery school group, the conspirators were simultaneously building up the Bavarian Illuminati into a political organization. The Bavarian Illuminati founded its first American branch in the form of the Skull and Bones Fraternity on the Yale College campus. At the same time as the Golden Dawn and Skull and Bones were being groomed into a cult religion and a political order for a new age, governed entirely by the conspiracy, a young mountaineer named Aleister Crowley 
came to the attention of the secret chiefs when he joined the Golden Dawn. Crowley would go on to reform the Golden Dawn cult into his own format for a hierarchy, adding the Ipsissimus degree for one person to rule the whole occult network, and infused his creation entirely with his own ideas for the religious doctrine of this new age, which he called the Ordo Templi Orientis, the OTO. The outer order of the OTO, Crowley's concept for the New Age hierarchy of the complete occult network, was the Argentum Astrum, and used the first three degrees of the Golden Dawn Cipher Manuscript's rituals in place of those in the fraternal Blue Lodge degrees of contemporary Freemasonry. The inner order of the OTO was the upper Golden Dawn degrees, and those who had been initiated into the degrees of this level were allowed to know the secret that their entire group was being guided and controlled through the Bavarian Illuminati. Thus, there was an outer head above the outer order co-Masonic degrees, and an inner head above the inner order Illuminist degrees, which Crowley proclaimed himself to occupy, called the Ipsissimus degree. All of this served the will of the conspirators quite well, considering they had orchestrated this whole chain of events, and wholly controlled Crowley and his choices, without ever needing to make their true personages known, even to him. The conspirators were overseeing the restructuring of the whole network of Jacobin Freemasonry via the Golden Dawn into the OTO and had planted the first seeds of conspiracy-controlled Illuminism in the USA with skull and bones at the same time they began developing the Bavarian Illuminati into a New Age religious-based political movement in Germany meant to reconquer all of Europe for the conspiracy. The New Age religious movement was based on German theosophical concepts and was called the Thule Society, or the Order of the Black Sun. The political party that was eventually reconstituted from this original esoteric study group was called NASDAP, the National German Workers' Party, or the National Socialists, and history remembers them now as the Nazis. We consider it today a good goal for the USA to have defeated the German Nazis in World War II, because we see it as a political victory for democracy over the concept of a state tyranny. However, what few realize is that this war was only fought by we the people, but was orchestrated fomented, and commanded on both sides by the conspiracy. The Skull and Bone Secret Society Yale College Campus Fraternity had already grown extremely influential and had produced several men already who had entered politics and gone on to hold high offices in U.S. democracy, even while totally committed to not only loyalty to the Bavarian Illuminati's goals expressed as the Protocols, but also to secretly funding Adolf Hitler's Third Reich under the German Nazis. These men were war criminals and national traitors guilty of treason, but despite including many subsequent presidents of the USA, their names are inconsequential footnotes beside the goals of those hidden conspirators who truly ruled the world at that time. Thus, we can say they were the only true winners of World War II, and their ideals, as expressed by Aleister Crowley, their modern-era mouthpiece, have utterly usurped the real goals of the Gnostic Christians and the Hermetic Templar Rosicrucian Freemason Jacobins. The losers of the last aeon have included the words and message for, of the true historical person of Jesus, 
which were lost at the time of Constantine to the Catholic message of the crucifixion, superseding the symbol of the ichthos fish with the symbol of the Christian cross. The Templars were the next group to lose, betrayed by the Roman Catholic Pope of the Christian Church for revealing the true Gnostic doctrine of Jesus' own Christianity. The Hermetic Templar Rosicrucianism of Dr. John Dee has also been diluted in meaning and relevance by the Golden Dawn cipher documents, reforming his cult to a new degree system and a new age religion designed by Aleister Crowley. The original perfectibilist order of Dr. Adam Weishaupt, which began as a correspondence course participated in by the greatest intellects of his day, was destroyed in its purge from Bavaria and reshaped into a tool of evil. The penultimate losers to the conspiracy over the last aeon are the free and accepted Masons, whose anti-papist origins in Jacobin secret societies has resulted in somehow implicated in them in the originally Jesuit conspiracy of the Illuminati to overthrow all democratic governments and replace Christianity with Satanism. The final and biggest losers over the last aeon to the evil plotting of the triumvirate conspiracy of assassins have been the American people who for the entire 20th century were being bred, trained, and paid to serve the will of these secret elites. These elites have gained their authority by purchasing the buying power of privately owned banks. They can loan any sum beyond their own savings and charge limitless interest rates on this loan. Thus, the Bavarian perfectibilists began as intellectuals and Freemasons, but by the time they were purged as the Illuminati, they had already acquired control of the financial institutions of Europe and formed the first privately owned national banks. The skull and bones frat graduates of Yale came to occupy most of the offices of highest authority in the U.S. democracy by the turn of the 20th century and assumed a massive level of control over the military might of the USA by the era of World War I. Following World War I, the United States Congress was forced to adopt a privately owned central bank as the sole no-bid contractor to the national democratic government, and this bank proceeded to crash the U.S. stock market and bring about the Great Depression that would lead America toward further economic dependence. Both world wars were fought to spread the reach and strength of the concept of central banks, and by the end of the First World War, during the ratification of the Treaty of Versailles that would financially bankrupt Germany and allow the Nazis to usher in World War II, the members of the first Federal Reserve Board of the U.S., partnered with their European counterparts to form the Council on Foreign Relations, or CFR. As their influence expanded across Asia as well, by the 1940s, the conspiracy expanded its round table think tanks membership to include Asian nation representatives, and the result was the formation of the Trilateral Commission. Other organizations, such as the media and political organizing Bilderberg Group, below the CFR, and the above-top-secret-level alien cover-up group called Majestic 12, below the Trilateral Commission, are so confidential they do not even have emblems. All the living members of these round-table think tank occult political groups worship together annually at a resort called the Bohemian Grove Camp, where they practice ritual human sacrifice to a giant statue of an owl symbolizing Malak. This entire schema of groups outside the U.S. democratically 
elected government comprise what is today considered the shadow government that is really running the world, the conspiracy responsible for staging all world events of any consequence on all scopes of scale. Following the neocon coup d'etat during the staged recount of the 2000 elections for U.S. President, when the grandson of a Nazi sympathizer, son of a skull and bonesman, George W. Bush, was appointed to a democratically elected position by the U.S. Supreme Court, despite not having been elected by Democratic votes, the shadow government became the de facto rulers of the USA. It is worth a brief examination of how these occult roundtable groups have assumed power over the democracy of the USA since they represent the globalist agenda of the international conspiracy to destroy democracy and all national sovereignty and replace them with a single global king. The shadow government conspiracy we know of as ruling behind the scenes today was not always believed to be the natural result of an inherent and exploitable flaw in U.S. constitutional concepts of American democracy as it is seen as today. Originally, U.S. constitutional American democracy was a working concept that had no need of a central bank nor any form of direct taxation, such as income tax, to fund its public works projects. Smaller government meant a larger private sector, and eventually corporations began to outlast their government contracts. To police the American people from interstate commerce crimes, such as corporate price fixing, tax evasion, and criminal racketeering, the U.S. created the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, during Prohibition to bust up rum-running rings run by low-level thugs like mafia gangsters. The logo of the FBI was the shield of the Justice Department. Following World War II, many of the Nazi funders and Skull and Bones men who owned the U.S. Federal Reserve Central Bank, founded the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, to spy on the enemies of America in foreign countries, namely the Soviet Russians who came to power following the Rockefeller funding of the Red Revolution under Vladimir Lenin. In the logo of the CIA, an eagle raises its head from behind a shield that bears a red cross star on a white field. The next wing of the national intelligence community formed following the CIA was the National Security Agency, the NSA, whose main task was deciphering encoded enemy communications during the Cold War between the USA and Soviet Union. The NSA logo shows the eagle holding a key behind the U.S. flag on a shield. The CIA and NSA are governmental departments in the U.S. intelligence community that are equivalent in status and rank system in the private sector to the armed personnel of the U.S. military, and all of these answer to the orders handed down to them from the U.S. Department of Defense, or DOD, operated out of the Pentagon building in Washington, D.C. The seal of the DOD depicts the American flag-shielded eagle in flight, holding three arrows to symbolize the weapons of war coming in the form of death from above. The intelligence community and armed services under the DOD and the Pentagon in turn answer to the commander-in-chief of the entire U.S. government, the democratically elected president of the USA. The seal of the executive office of the U.S. is almost identical to the front of the great seal of the U.S. and shows the eagle aloft bearing a banner in its beak reading E Pluribus Unum, meaning one for all, and holding in its talons a bundle of arrows in one and a bundle of olive branches in the other. However, since 9-11-2001, 
the neocons who assumed authority over the democracy of the USA, established a concept called Continuity of Government, or COG, that allows a redundant location for all essential government personnel in a deep underground base in the event of a nuclear war. The logo of the group of security personnel manning these bases and their satellite concentration camps, the Department of Homeland Security, or DHS, shows the presidential eagle aloft, however replaces the flag of the USA on the shield in front of the eagle with symbols of land, sea, and air, signifying global U.S. military dominance. The neocons adopted a variation of the U.S. flag as their logo, but enacted the legislation of warrantless wiretapping, kidnapping to and torture at secret death camps of suspected terrorists who are not only citizens of foreign nations, but include also citizens of America as well. The neocons of the W. Bush administration are not loyal to the U.S. Constitution of American democracy they took their oaths of office to protect and do not value democratic ideals, but instead value the ideals expressed in the protocols and swear allegiance in secret at Bohemian Grove to the conspiracy of assassins. The neocon shadow government mechanism remains attached to the U.S. constitutional American democratic government in the form of these alphabet soup agencies even now in 2011 A.D. However, there remains hope we, the people, can overthrow this mechanism through democracy and or a peaceful uprising. The conspirators' worst fear is exposure for their crimes against humanity and for their collaboration with their alleged enemies in behind-the-scenes backroom shady deals to defraud the people and render them into slaves under a one-world king. The conspirators must remain in hiding, operating their key players from behind the scenes for their conspiracy to be successful. In order to do this, they apply Hegelian dialectics to pit one side of any issue against the other and get brother to kill brother in a disagreement they foment between them over an ideal both share. The CFR was founded by the same people who funded the Bolshevik communists in Russia. By using the goal of world peace as a bait, the CFR was able to form the world's first League of Nations, which was meant to form a multinational army to enforce the will of its diplomatic representatives to protect the world from future uprisings by mad tyrants. The League of Nations was so odious a concept, the U.S. Congress never ratified U.S. membership in it, and insofar as it professed to offer global peace, it failed to prevent the Great Depression or the consequences thereof in the form of World War II. By the beginning of World War II, the Federal Reserve Central Bank of the USA had grown large enough to privately fund both sides of the war, and thus they paid for the weapons of both the Allies and the Axis powers, and so both went into debt to them. The Nazis arose in Germany, and sought to conquer and unify Europe into a New Age occult version of the old Holy Roman Empire of Catholic Christendom. The result of their attempt at such and defeat at the hands of the USA and its allies was the creation of the Nation of Israel by reallocation of land assets conquered by the Axis powers tied to Germany, then reconquered by US and Allied forces in the Middle East annexing nearly all of Palestine, including the Holy Lands around Jerusalem. Just as the theft of the Holy Land from the indigenous Muslim Arabs when Palestine was repopulated as Israel was meant to and did accomplish the replacement of the German Third Reich 
with an equally powerful Nazi superstate centered in the Middle East, so too did World War II end by replacing the League of Nations with the United Nations, wherein the U.S. has a permanent seat on the five-member Security Council. The United Nations is, to its member nation states, what Aleister Crowley's OTO Bund was to all the Jacobin Freemasonic lodges, networking them together under the Illuminati and then reshaping their goals to match those of the Illuminati protocols. It is a sham attempt toward global governance by a single dictator, meant to prove by false flag attack that democracy inevitably fails. It is quite lucky for those of us who, like you and I are now, are researching conspiracy theories, that those in the true and real conspiracy are such revolting, idiotic dolts. All the flags they have invented have been only white or yellow and blue. Consider the League of Nations flag showing a white pentagram inside a blue pentagram inside a blue outlined pentagon on a blank white field. The pentagram, as we established during the discussion on the alchemical Rosicrucians, symbolizes humanity as our two legs, two arms, and head. One iteration up the number of stellations from the pentagram on the flag of the League of Nations is the hexagram on the flag of the Nation of Israel, shown here also as blue on white and symbolizing the Star of David, which itself was meant to signify the dimensions of the Ark used as the foundation for the architectural designs for the first temple constructed by King Solomon. The logo of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which provides the Army of Europe when called upon by the UN, just as the Pentagon controls the U.S. Army, shows a white, target-shaped star of four cardinal compass points on a blue field. The logo of the European Union, the EU, shows a circle of twelve pentagram stars in yellow on a field of blue. The EU has its own currency and has bloodlessly unified most of Europe over the last fifty years, just as the American Revolutionary War unified the British colonies into the United States some 200 years before. Finally, the logo of the United Nations, the UN, is a white globe seen from above the North Pole surrounded by twin white olive branches on a blue field. The use of the color blue is meant to symbolize world peace throughout all these flags, and all these organizations were started by cowardly, conspiratorial, central bank owners. We might look for a suitable name for the conspirators who rule from behind the scenes today, and who shape and control all events of consequence on the world stage, and settle for Nazis, since that is the name of the philosophy they all, from the German Illuminati to the U.S. neocons today, worship and adhere to. However, it is more important to remember that these mere Nazi religion idiots now wield the same sum of power always sought after by the secret conspirators and the assassins who killed Julius Caesar and Jesus Christ, no less so than Russian Tsar Nicholas Romanov and U.S. President John Kennedy. The same mindset possessed the assassin senators who killed Julius Caesar as those men now in power who seek to lop the head off of anyone who sticks their neck up above the poverty line of lowest possible personal power. The same secret order of men that they formed then exists now and its members remain privy to all the plans behind politics and religion that comprise all significant events on the world stage today. We call them simply the Conspiracy. Past Politics 101b Symbolism of the U.S. Great Seal
If a picture says a thousand words, we can tell very much even from a simple symbol. The great seal of the United States Democratic Republic, designed by its founders who drafted the Constitution for its government, is meant to symbolize a great many images in a small, concise form. Although we see it every day on money nowadays, its symbolism seems to mean very little to most of us, although it was designed to mean very much by those who drafted it. However, as we have seen, the U.S. Great Seal is only one image, potentially symbolic of Satan as the demiurge or anti-god, out of hundreds and thousands of others that can be seen to stand for the thoughts of different groups at different times. Thus, what we can learn from the U.S. Great Seal, we must see in historical context and only of being true from the point of view of those who created it, that is, the founders of the United States Democratic Republic form of government. So, to study the Great Seal of the United States, we begin by examining the front side of it first, and by studying the symbolism of its imagery in both historical religious and political context. To begin examining the front side of the Great Seal, we study the image of the bald eagle in flight, behind the American flag shield, gripping in one talon a quiver of arrows, and in the other a branch of olive leaves, and holding in its beak a banner reading E Pluribus Unum. The overall image connotes the aerial strength of U.S. national spirit in the form of the national bird behind the American flag shield. The head of this image of the bald eagle on the front of the U.S. Great Seal augments this assessment of the prowess and power of this symbol of national unity in the form of an expression of military might. Its expression of stern severity is unmistakable in its grim visage. However, at the back of the bald eagle's head, there is one tussled feather must messily on his head. This is where the mysterious origins of this symbol begin being implied. The upright feather on the dorsal crest of a bird of prey's fledged scalp has long represented the sole distinguishing characteristic trait of the phoenix, a mythical symbol of the fire bird, the common chicken hawk falcon, or the wild turkey buzzard eagle. The head feather of the sunbird is upturned uniquely when it is meant to symbolize the phoenix, a symbol of fire from Dark Ages alchemy appropriated from Greek myths. Originally, this zoomorph in Greek myths referred to a southern hemisphere constellation, or star pattern, visible only in the southern hemisphere night sky. From Greece, the phoenix would have been the southernmost constellation visible in the southern night sky. Hence, it was symbolic of the course taken by the sun over the duration of the day, from dawn till dusk, and the apparently miraculous rebirth of the sun in the east at dawn following night when it sets in the west. The phoenix, thus, was also a symbol of death and resurrection, alike the snake that sheds its skin. In its use in Dark Ages alchemy, the phoenix was portrayed as double-headed to refer to a peculiar fable involving a full-fledged eagle and an eagle whose head feathers never grew in and who remained bald. There is much mystery that remains even now about the meanings of alchemical symbolism. However, there remain strong ties within alchemical art between the phoenix and the serpent as an Ouroboros, a snake eating its own tail. Despite its murky origins in alchemical symbolism during the European Dark Ages, the double-headed eagle appears again in the heraldic shield of the Habsburg family, who reigned as the Holy Roman Emperors from the end of the Dark Ages until the early 20th century, when they were unseated during World War I. The double-headed eagle appears here above the Habsburg family crest from a low-relief carving in stone. 
we see the same double-headed eagle in the coat of arms of the Russian Tsar Romanov's family crest. The appearance in both crests is superior to the shield of the heraldic coat of arms of the double-headed phoenix, seen here in black, indicates the alliance between the Habsburg and Romanov families that posed a threat to the power structure desired by the CFR in funding the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. At the time of the signing of the American Declaration of Independence from rule by Great Britain, the Habsburgs were seen as unpopular monarchs who supported the old world government of papal Christendom and who had funded the Rothschild dynasty of international bankers to acquire majority shares in all holdings traded on the stock markets of Europe. The Rothschilds were seen as particularly odious to the public interest by the time of the Nazis, and this unpopular point of view on them aided and assisted in allowing the Holocaust to come about, wherein the Nazis slaughtered six million so-called Jews across Europe. However, at the time of the founding of America as a democratic republic, by the original founding fathers who drafted the constitution of its government, the Trenchard design for the great seal of the U.S., showed only a single-headed eagle in mid-flight behind a shield marked by the 13 vertical red and white stripes and a horizontal blue field of the American flag. The bald eagle, as has been indicated, represented the younger or unfledged alchemical phoenix. The double-headed eagle image would appear again later in the symbol of the 33rd degree commandery of the Scottish Rite of Free and Accepted Masonry. The Scottish Rite came during the 19th century to supplant the British York Rite practiced by the Founding Fathers the century before. By the beginning of the 20th century, Scottish Rite was the dominant Masonic Rite in America. The Scottish Rite was designed around the time of the American Civil War and showed an eagle with wings lowered to signify the southern, and an eagle with wings raised, the northern, jurisdictions during the Civil War between the Northern Union and Southern Rebel States. It was not until after the Civil War this image was shown as a double-headed bald eagle wearing a single crown. However, by this point, the Scottish Rite Masons had already achieved many prominent positions in the governments on both local, state, and national federal levels. The eagle on the Great Seal of the United States is essentially similar to the eagle emblazoned on the presidential seal of the executive branch of the U.S. government. Both show the same bald eagle holding arrows and olive branches, behind an American flag shield, clutching a banner in its beak that reads E Pluribus Unum, Latin for the saying, All for One. However, the eagle on the great seal, and thus imprinted on our money, possesses one trait the eagle on the presidential seal lacks. That is the presence above the eagle's head of the hexagrammatic constellation of 13 pentagrams, that was added some time following the Great Seal's original design by Trenchard in the late 1770s. This six-sided hexagram star of 13 pentagram points does not appear in the presidential seal and is similar in shape and significance to a symbol that appears in only one other place during our modern era. On the flag of Israel, the hexagram star symbolizes the seal of King David, given to his son Solomon, who used it to design and command the building of the first temple to the Hebrew God. This temple was built in Jerusalem, in the Holy Lands, in modern-day Israeli-occupied Palestine. The reverse side of the Great Seal is also shown on the back of the U.S. $1 Federal Reserve note. The ominous emblem has come for so many to symbolize the conspiracy for a global dictatorship, the eye in the triangle above the pyramid with no capstone, was never truly a Masonic symbol, 
but was a symbol of the contemporary, competitive, and clandestine cult, the Bavarian Illuminati. Above and below it reads the slogan, Annuit Queptus Novus Ordo Seclorum, meaning, Fortune favors the New World Order. Being in Latin, the language of Rome, this message may appear to have been, when conceived, a warning from our Masonic founders against the influence on American government by Catholic papal interests. The motif of the eye in the triangle atop the pyramid with no capstone is labeled at its base in Roman numerals with the year of the USA's founding. It was in this same year the Bavarian perfectibilists of Dr. Adam Weishaupt became the Illuminati and attempted to infiltrate Jacobin masonry in order to redirect its goals from within. The eye in the triangle itself is believed to have been meant as an Illuminati symbol of God. Because the depiction of God is forbidden in Islam, believed impossible in Hebrew Judaism, and prescribed against as idolatry by Catholicism. The symbolic depiction of God in this Illuminati symbol is patently satanic, and thus shows not the universal Father God, Yehovah Allah, but only the Gnostic demiurge called Satan. Because of the prescription against painting the portrait of God, were adhered to by most monotheists. It was rare to find a depiction of the Holy Father deity in art until the beginning of the Renaissance in Italy, contemporary to the late Sephardic era in Spain. This period of high arts and sciences being developed rapidly gives us this depiction by Antoniazzo Romano of God as an old Caucasoid complexion man with a long gray beard. Above his head is a triangular halo symbolizing Catholic Trinitarianism. In this depiction of Christ's Last Supper, called Supper at Amos, by Jacopo Carucci, called Panormo, from 1525, we see the first use of the eye in the triangle motif to symbolize the all-seeing eye of God, called since the Eye of Providence. The Eye of Providence was a commonly occurring symbol in the working craft tools of Blue Lodge, York Wright, Free and Accepted Masonry around the time of the founding of the U.S., the drafting of its constitution, and the formation of its democratic republic government by Freemasons. Here, the Eye of Providence looks down over a host of Masonic symbols signifying God as dominant to all the working craft tools. When Trenchard, a Freemason, designed the U.S. Great Seal for the new government of America, there was no such symbol at that time in any form of free and accepted Masonry as the eye above the pyramid below. It was seen as a new symbol meant to symbolize a new order ruled over from the new world. Thus, the Eye of Providence symbolized not God, but the conspiracy, as dominant above the great work of Freemasonry. The closest Freemasonic symbol at the time of the Great Seal's design to the proposed motif for its reverse side, the Eye above the Pyramid, was the Beehive. During the era of the American Revolution, the York Rite held the beehive symbol to be a warning to individual masons to avoid being a drone to the hive mind and to think for themselves. By the time of the U.S. Civil War, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry had supplanted that meaning for the same symbol with their own, which revolved around the beehive signifying industriousness, safety in a large numbered group, strength of purpose, focus of willpower, and direction of goal. The thirteen steps of the pyramid on the Great Seal are said to signify the thirteen British colonies that unified to form the first states of America's democratic republic. The year in Roman numerals at the base is 1776, the year of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, 
However, the capstone of the pyramid is missing in accordance with the Mason myth regarding the royal arch, and so this would signify an additional step level. The 13 stripes and 13 stars on the original American flag also symbolize the 13 American states formed from the 13 British colonies, and so we see the similar motif of 13 horizontal bars of alternating red and white on the original U.S. flag as the 13 steps up from the base of the pyramid to the top level of its missing capstone on the reverse of the U.S. Great Seal. The most Masonic trait of this originally Illuminati-influenced symbol is its design depicting sacred geometric ratios such as one-half and one-third, or the harmonic and golden means. These measurements are known to date back at least as far as ancient Greece, seem to have been used in calculating the inner chambers of the Great Pyramid of Egypt, and signify an important symbol to all speculative Freemasons in the form of Euclid's 47th proposition from Book 10 of his Elements of Geometry. The ratios between the level of the pyramid's missing capstone, the base of the eye and the triangle above this, and the apex of the eye's triangle above that, form the golden ratio proportion, and this can be depicted as a spiral that reduces its size toward the pupil of the eye in the very center of the triangle. It could be this sacred geometrical ratio that is symbolically implied by the strange triple concentric rings of the iris around the pupil of the eye in the triangle on the reverse side of the great seal. While being particularly appealing toward masons by incorporating these ratios, this side of the great seal was never meant to be seen by the eyes of uninitiates. Hence, why it is printed so small on money that it is nearly impossible to tell that the iris has three concentric rings. Having now examined the symbolism of the Great Seal designed by Freemasons at the time of the American Revolution, we will next begin to look at the lives of those Masons who founded the American government system as a democratic republic. The symbolism on the seal they invented for the form of government clearly does not depict the nature of a democratic republic, as we shall see in further lectures soon. Instead, the eye and the pyramid below the eagle above symbolize a Ponzi scheme, alike that proposed by Weishaupt for doubling the membership in the perfectibilists. Which was the dream of the American Freemasons who started the Revolutionary War who were Jacobin anti-papists, but who were not Bavarian Illuminati. Here is the face of America's first president, General George Washington, who came to fame by many victorious battles during the American Revolution. Is this the face of the first dictator over America's shadow government, comprised of Freemasons working behind the scenes of public politics? to achieve the Illuminati goals listed in the protocols of a single global dictator. Past Politics 101C The Masonic Revolution Here we see the appearance and garb of a common couple of colonialist aristocrats. He wears a wig of white horsehair, she a lace collar, both furled sleeves, she a corset and a hoop skirt, he a coat with tails, a cravat, silk vest and garters, etc. In short, they are dressed to the tees, in the latest fashions of Britain and France, and have an air of wit that attracts reverence about them. In short, they are fops. Here is how the Puritan commoner of the American colonists looked, most usually to these colonialist aristocrats. Charged in kangaroo courts with empty crimes such as witchcraft, alike the era of the Inquisition, the Puritan Christian lower class serfs in the American colonies had little or no rights under British rule and paid import taxes on all products so steep they were held in perpetual bankruptcy and converted to the level of debt slaves. 
This drastic class disparity finally came to an explosive head when a group of Freemasons dressed as Native Americans boarded a British ship in Boston Harbor and proceeded to unload its cargo into the harbor's water. This event, called soon afterwards the Boston Tea Party, sparked a revolutionary inspiration in commoners across the British colonies in America. Rallying around the cry of freedom with such slogans as Give me liberty or give me death, the commoner colonists were quickly rounded up and conscripted into a guerrilla tactic, plain clothes, irregular army comprised of regiments of armed militias under the leadership of General George Washington. In spite of slim odds resulting from unusually extremely cold weather conditions, Washington's troops, camped at Valley Forge, managed to cross the Potomac River to win one of the most decisive victories for the American colonists in the war against the British occupation. Washington, following the Revolutionary War, presided over the ratification and signing of the Constitution of the newly forming United States of America, and was present during many of the debates in the Continental Congress that shaped the future destiny of the American government into its eventual form as a representative democratic republic. Naturally, as one of the best generals during the American Revolution, George Washington was picked as the first President of the United States for his popularity with the people and for his close friendships with the other founding fathers. On his deathbed, George Washington was surrounded by many of the brightest minds alive at his time and had helped with them to shape the history of a new nation into a form of democracy they believed could be preserved through long decades of intervening times yet to come. So who was this charismatic, wig-wearing American patriot who saw the value of defending democratic ideals like personal freedom and representative government as important enough to risk his own life on the battlefield to uphold his virtues? The general who would become the first president of the newly founded nation of the United States of America, George Washington, was, first and foremost, a free and accepted Mason. Seen here laying the cornerstone of the U.S. Capitol building, Washington wears the jewel and apron of a master Mason, the third degree in the Blue Lodge of contemporary York Rite Freemasonry. Here we see the preserved cloth of George Washington's own actual Freemasonic apron, which he would have used to perform ceremonially in Freemasonic rituals. In this modern replica, we see the same Eye of Providence above the alphabet of other Masonic emblems, including Euclid's 47th, the square and compass, the black and white tiled floor, the twin pillars, the coffin and sprig of acacia, as were all seen originally on the Freemason apron of America's first president, General George Washington. But what does it mean for George Washington to have been a Freemason? Here we see him holding his hand inside his jacket while on the battlefield of the American Revolutionary War. Here we see a contemporary painting of Gilbert de Montier, Marquis de Lafayette, a commander general in the Continental Army who served during the Revolutionary War under General George Washington. Notice he is also holding his hand inside his vest beneath his coat. Lafayette was a French Freemason who also served as commander-in-chief of the French National Guard and in that position attempted to quell the growing French Revolution by ordering his troops to fire on unarmed protesters. Contemporary to Lafayette's service during the French Revolution, we find this painting of a young Napoleon Bonaparte who had already acquired the habit of keeping one hand inside his jacket. Here seen later, painted during his time as Emperor of France, 
We see Napoleon maintain this peculiar habit of posture in all his portraiture poses, and held his hand inside his jacket as a general rule of habit. Interestingly enough, we see here in this photographic portrait of John Wilkes Booth, the assassin of U.S. President Abraham Lincoln, following the American Civil War, the same pose as in the others of George Washington, Lafayette, and Napoleon, with his hand tucked up inside his jacket. This pose, with the hand tucked into the front coat pocket, arm held at a right angle crook at the elbow, is a symbolic gesture used to convey a certain meaning during the ritual ceremonies performed by York Rite Blue Lodge Free and Accepted Masons. So, again, what does it mean for George Washington, the Revolutionary War General and First President of the United States of America, to have been a Freemason? It means that he, like the other founding fathers of the American nation, who were also Freemasons, would be venerated by being carved and portrayed in stone, and his life would be commemorated by a massive megalithic monument. The statue of George Washington, housed in his Masonic monument, depicts him seated on a throne, covered by a toga, bare-chested, holding forth the handle of a sheathed sword in his left hand, and pointing up to the sky with his right forefinger. The pose of Washington's statue is meant to imitate a statue of Zeus found during the Greek Golden Age in his temple on the Acropolis and considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Its size was unrivaled besides the giant of Gibraltar. This Roman duplicate shows, on a much smaller scale, roughly what the statue's pose was, holding forth a lightning bolt in his right hand and pointing to himself with his left forefinger. The statue of George Washington clearly has the left hand offering the sword and the right hand pointing up toward heaven. However, as we may see on this ancient Greek coin, this posture may indeed have been the same as the original statue of Zeus, shown here bald and seated with a staff in his left hand and a bird above his right. The symbolism of depicting General Washington, who became the first president of the Democratic Republic of America, in the same posture as the ancient statue of Zeus, king over the pantheon of other gods, draws more than an illusion to the divine authority of the office in the form of Washington's offering the methods of war and peace to the onlooker. It also symbolizes the place of this office in the constellation of other roles played by the founding fathers commemorated in stone as well. The painting in the oculus of the dome above the statue of George Washington in the pose of the Greek god Zeus in his Masonic monument shows Washington seated among a circle of angels in rationalist-era ultra-realism style. In this painting that rivals the concept of the Sistine Chapel ceiling frescoes by Michelangelo, we see Washington conversing with a round table of angelic hosts from below looking up, such that he appears to be floating on a ring of cloud above the onlooker at a round table meeting of angels. Most of the founding fathers and many of the earliest presidents following George Washington were Freemasons. The Boston Tea Party had been organized by Freemasons from the Green Dragon Pub, which served also as a York Rite Lodge. Most of the signers of both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States were Freemasons. For these reasons, we will examine only a few of these famous men who have had their contributions to American history preserved in stone monuments in Washington, D.C., the federal capital of the USA. The quote that goes, I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man, is attributed to the great deist philosopher of the American Revolutionary Era, 
Framer of the Constitution and author of the Bill of Rights and Freemason, Thomas Jefferson. As we can see here, the Jefferson Memorial Building in Washington, D.C. sits with its front face of pillars and angled roof alike a Spartan interpretation of the Athenian Acropolis architecture facing the shore of the Potomac River. Inside the rotunda, beneath the exact oculus of the enormous domed roof of the Jefferson Memorial, is a huge statue of Thomas Jefferson holding a rolled-up copy of a scroll meant to symbolize the U.S. Constitution. This statue is several times life-size scale and faces east to symbolize Jefferson's Masonic role as a light-bringer. The enormous rotunda is surrounded by four walls containing etched sayings of Jefferson's, and above it is the oculus of the domed ceiling. Around the rim of the oculus's dome ceiling is written Jefferson's most famous saying, I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man that typifies his transcendentalist deism and flair for liberal democratic thinking. Other quotes by Jefferson adorn the walls of his memorial such as this one dealing with the modernization and reinterpretation of constitutional laws, this one expressing his feelings on slavery and education, and this one stating unequivocally his passion for the right of freedom of expression. Next in our tour of the Founding Fathers' Masonic Memorials in Washington, D.C., is this building, designed after the ancient temple of Zeus itself, called the Lincoln Memorial, built to honor the 16th U.S. President, Abraham Lincoln. As the Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial also houses an enormous statue of its subject. However, while Jefferson's statue is metal and standing upright, Lincoln is carved from marble and sitting down. Above Lincoln is inscribed a dedication to him for saving the Union, referring to his role as President of the Northern Union States during the American Civil War against the Southern Rebel Confederacy States. Like the Jefferson Memorial positioned on the shore of the Potomac River, the Lincoln Memorial is also positioned above water in the form of the long, narrow, man-made pond called the Reflecting Pool on the Great Mall of Washington, D.C. Because of this, as Lincoln's enormous statue faces west, he is always looking in the direction of the reflecting pool and, across it from the Lincoln Memorial, at the enormous stele of the Washington Monument. The stele of the Washington Monument is directly west from the Lincoln Memorial at the opposite end of the long reflecting pool and at an angle further to the west from the Washington Monument Steely is the Capitol Building housing the Congress of the U.S. government. The Washington Monument is, like the separate Washington Masonic Monument, an enormous steely designed to resemble the so-called Cleopatra's Needle steely designs of ancient Egypt. The difference between the Washington Monument steely and the steely of ancient Egypt is that the Washington Monument is hollow and contains a staircase and elevator that ascend to the top. Here is a view from the top of the Washington Monument of the Lincoln Memorial at the opposite end of the reflecting pool. The orientation of the Lincoln Memorial to the Washington Monument forms a line along the long, narrow reflecting pool between them. At an angle from this line, beyond the Washington Monument, in a western direction, is the Capitol Building, which serves as the location for the dual Senate and House of Representatives. The Washington Monument is shaped like an Egyptian stele, which were often used to measure changes in duration over the seasons of the length of the day by measuring the length of shadows cast by the stele at various points throughout the day. 
The role of the Washington Monument stele is similar, with the reflecting pool acting like an enormous mirror by which to place a stationary landmark for measuring the stele's shadow. The last Masonic founding father of the U.S. Democratic Republic, we will cover here briefly, does not have a memorial or monument built to him in Washington, D.C., however is often unrecognized for the contribution he was in the room during the designing of, that being the U.S. Great Seal itself, both front and back. It is possible the Trenchard sketch for the eye atop the pyramid symbol was transmitted by Benjamin Franklin from the European Freemason lodges where the Illuminati had infiltrated to suppress Jacobinism, brought back by him as America's first French ambassador, and incorporated into the original designs for the Great Seal of the USA. We know that Franklin was an active Freemason, for he wrote about Masonry from the point of view of a Mason himself, and is thus remembered as not only one of the founding luminaries of the American Democratic Republic, but also a free-thinking scientific genius of the age of reason. Here we see a modern depiction of Benjamin Franklin in the same coat of Masonic dress as we are already now familiar with from seeing George Washington wearing it. The apron, the jewel, the surrounding symbols of the working tools of craft masonry all appear alike the authentic art depicting George Washington in his garb and attire as a Freemason. However, this modern depiction of Benjamin Franklin dressed as a Freemason is a forgery, or rather, is plagiarized from another picture which shows the same layout but a different person at the focal point of the portrait than Franklin. This older and original painting shows not Ben Franklin, but the Marquis Lafayette. It is known Lafayette was a Freemason, along with Franklin and Washington, and we are reminded again of the connection between Lafayette and Washington, formed by Franklin, all of whom were Masons. Lafayette's peculiar pose, copied by Washington and Napoleon alike, may now be understood as a Masonic hailing sign signifying a special meaning known only to Freemasons. Because he is the most recognizable, most well-known, and most popularly liked of all of them, George Washington is seen as the preeminent Masonic president. However, in truth, he is not the only U.S. president to have been a Freemason. No fewer than ten presidents, including Washington, have been confirmed to non-initiates as having been free and accepted Masons. Washington was first, but not last, among a long line of presidents who had advanced into Blue Lodge Masonry, most of whom went further on into the upper-level degrees of the York or Scottish Rites. Also, all of these presidents are distinguished in another way, which I will discuss more about soon, and that is that they all opposed central banking. The 33rd U.S. President, Harry Truman, is shown here in April and Jewel holding a gavel. There is every reason to believe, and very little reason to doubt, that all of the greatest men whose minds shaped the course of American politics between the eras of Washington and Truman, were free and accepted Masons. Washington's being a Freemason seems to have set the standard that all ranking members of highest political offices must belong also to this popular esoteric order. The nature of Freemason remains, to this day, a secret society. However, many, if not most, of its so-called secrets are available in public publications, and can be known even by a non-Mason often more easily than even by some Masons. The doors seen in this picture, leading to the inside of the Washington, D.C. Scottish Rite Temple, conceal many secrets, but most of them are about the men who were Freemasons in the past, and are only secrets because they would prove slightly controversial if revealed 
as being true instead of the official stories taught to and accepted by children as school book history. There is, in short, nothing all too shocking behind the lodge door of Freemasonry. To scale the three steps up and to knock on the door is all that is required to gain entrance, because to become a Mason, all one must do is to ask a Mason how to do so. Once one is sponsored by a brother Mason, one is asked three questions. That is all it takes to qualify for the initiation ritual. However, because there is a reenactment of a death scene participated in by the blindfolded candidate of the third degree ritual, Freemasonry is often misunderstood as teaching a dark-oriented or death-centered occultism. Nothing, to my experience, could be further from the truth. All the Masons I know now and have ever met are good men whom Masonry makes better and are bound to keep secret only the topics they discuss in private within the lodge with other Masons. The teachings of Freemasonry are inherently good, being based on a study of the working craft tools of the stone Masons who built the first temple in Jerusalem, overseen by King Solomon, son of King David. The concept of the divinity of monotheisms as the grand architect of the universe, the G in the square and compass symbolizing both God and geometry, precludes no other faiths from joining and excludes no one who believes in any form of higher power or deity. Besides dressing up in costumes, which would be difficult to explain the meanings of to children who might think them silly looking, Masonry conceals no secrets for which any Mason could truly be ashamed for keeping. While the costumes worn by the Masons in a lodge working any given initiation degree level ritual may change over time, the basic principles of free and accepted Masonry do not. The three candles on the checkered floor and the altar with the Bible on it are the most important working symbols of craft Freemasonry's alphabet of speculative philosophical tools. The altar signifies the candidate's soul as a rough ashlar they must work to make perfect. The three candles on the checkerboard signify the fellowship of other Masons in a democratic system as the method of accomplishing this, such as the meaning of the true and Masonic triumvirate conspiracy. Considering that so many of the greatest free thinkers among the most well-known and liked leaders of men have all belonged to the same cult of Freemasons and had access to the same libraries of documents kept available only to Freemasons, it should come as no huge surprise to learn many men, from Isaac Newton to Neil Armstrong, have all been high-degree initiate Freemasons of their day. To become a Mason, ask a Mason how to do so. By this simple method has this brotherhood been promulgated across many ages and eras until it has reached even this modern day. If you want to learn more about the impact of Freemasonry on the free thinking of the U.S. Founding Fathers, simply ask any U.S. Mason for an answer, and they will tell you truly too. Past Politics 101D Masons on Money The first U.S. President, George Washington, was a Freemason. Benjamin Franklin and other founding fathers of the Democratic Republic government of the USA were Freemasons too. Although this picture of Franklin in Masonic garb might be a forgery from a picture of Marquis de Lafayette, another revolutionary era Freemason of both the U.S. and France, friend of both Franklin and Washington. The fact many of the Founding Fathers were Freemasons cannot be denied. Theodore Teddy Roosevelt, the 26th President of the USA, was a Freemason. For his role in government funding nature conservatories buying up large masses of scenic rural landscapes, 
Teddy Roosevelt's face was carved onto Mount Rushmore in the Black Hills region of the Cheyenne and Lakota tribes of Native Americans. Roosevelt's face appears here between those of Abraham Lincoln to the right and Thomas Jefferson to the left, and all are lined up to the right of George Washington on the far left. As shown in the last lecture also, 33rd U.S. President Harry Truman was a Freemason. Truman was the president who staged the fake Japanese suicide bombing mission on Pearl Harbor Air Base in order to provoke the U.S. into entering World War II, and he was the president who ordered U.S. soldiers into war against the Nazis. Not all Freemasons might agree on all political topics. It is this natural disparity of political ideologies between brothers in the Lodge that allowed the doctrines and dogma of the Illuminati conspiracy to penetrate the depths of Freemasonic Lodges. Although many brother Freemasons are now members of the Illuminati conspiracy, not all are, and not all would want to be, even if they knew they could. The Illuminati, some of whom are also brothers in Freemasonic lodges, have conspired for the past century to control the currency of the United States dollar, and have accomplished this by using the Federal Reserve privately owned Central Bank of the Federal Government of the USA to transform the fixed value of gold as a solid form of currency into the fluid exchange rate of liquid fiat paper cash. Ironically, the Illuminati behind the Federal Reserve have traditionally placed the faces of their enemies onto this worthless paper cash and coinage. Thus, we have the modern expression, dead presidents, for our money, and the slang, chasing Benjamins, for the capitalist act of acquiring money. This placement of presidents as a place of honor onto this funny money being counterfeited on the mint's printing press by the laundry racket called the Federal Reserve, is an illusion meant to keep us addicted to seeing worthless paper cash as symbolic of real value. We have already established that George Washington, whose face we see here on the front of the $1 bill, was a Freemason. On the back of the $1 bill, opposite the side with President Washington's face, we find the Great Seal of the United States meant to never be used in vain. The fact that President Washington was a Freemason alone does not necessarily account for how he wound up with his face on our current form of money, but it's definitely a good start. All the Mason presidents on our cash have opposed the idea of allowing the USA to have a central bank. For this reason, all of their faces appear on our paper cash. Consider next our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, whose face appears on the $5 bill. Abraham Lincoln's statue in the Lincoln Memorial sits facing west toward a stele at sunset, symbolizing Anubis, the ancient god of death and holder of the keys to the underworld. Lincoln may or may not have been a Freemason of any kind. However, if we are to seriously consider him one also, then Lincoln's assassin, John Wilkes Booth, must also be considered one as well. Here we see Booth concealing his hand and his jacket in the standard Masonic hand sign of the master of the second veil. Here we see that founding father, Alexander Hamilton, whose face appears on the $10 bill Federal Reserve note. The seventh U.S. President, Andrew Jackson, whose face appears on the $20 bill Federal Reserve note. The Civil War commander and the 18th president, Ulysses S. Grant, whose face appears on the $50 bill Federal Reserve note. We're all Freemasons, and we're all opposed to the notion of a U.S. central bank, and all have faces that now appear on the same U.S. central bank's funny money. Benjamin Franklin, whose name appears on the $100 bill Federal Reserve note, 
was a founding father of American Democratic Republican government and a Freemason. Benjamin Franklin was a U.S. diplomat and, as such, was able to serve also as a courier between prominent Freemasons in different distant countries of timely Masonic communiques. As a spy, Benjamin Franklin was for American Masonry what Dr. John D. was for HMSS, pre-Scotland Yard, pre-MI6 British Intelligence. Although this picture with Benjamin Franklin dressed in Masonic garb in it may be a fake based on an identical earlier painting of Marquis Lafayette from the same time period, there is no question that Benjamin Franklin was a Freemason for contributing the Illuminati symbolism that formed the U.S. Great Seal, Benjamin Franklin is honored by having both his diagrammatic invention and his own visage appear on our worthless fiat paper cash. Abraham Lincoln, symbolizing both Anubis, Egyptian god of the dead, and Moses, the Hebrew prophet who freed his people from slavery to the pharaoh of Egypt, appears on the penny, the coinage equivalent of George Washington on the paper dollar as being the most common and worth least amount of money in circulation. On the back of the Lincoln head penny is depicted the Lincoln Memorial. As also mentioned above, the Lincoln Memorial is designed to resemble the architecture of the Temple to Zeus in the Greek Acropolis to their Olympic pantheon. The Lincoln Memorial is designed to symbolize the death of Zeus in exchange for the freedom of the Egyptian slaves, enacted in his life by President Lincoln's setting the African slaves in America free with the Emancipation Proclamation, followed by his being assassinated by a bullet in the brain by Southerner John Wilkes Booth. Thomas Jefferson's face appears in profile facing the opposite direction as Lincoln, on the US five cent nickel coin. On the back of the nickel coin is the Jefferson Memorial Building, which, as we have already seen, is a large circular dome above an open air rotunda. The Jefferson Memorial symbolizes the Oculus of God with the enshrined soul of Thomas Jefferson central to its core, peering upward toward the heavens and showing the way to search for ideals in politics. Although Thomas Jefferson was able to get so many Freemasons and founding fathers, each with their own political and religious ideologies, to agree on signing the U.S. Constitution. And although Jefferson was instrumental in bringing together the dozens of Freemasons who signed the American Declaration of Independence, because he opposed the idea of a central bank, when it came time to put his face on money, they could only manage to find room for him on the $2 bill. Hence the expression, queer as a $2 bill, because to see one of them in circulation is unusually rare. The face of the 34th president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or FDR, is stamped onto the front of the dime or ten cent piece. Like Jefferson on the nickel, but unlike Lincoln, he looks from right to left. FDR was a prominent Shriner, an appendant body to the proper Freemasonic Lodge. FDR was president during the second half of World War II, following Truman. Although aging and suffering from pronounced Parkinson's syndrome, FDR attended the Winter Post-War Peace Conference with Winston Churchill of Great Britain and Joseph Stalin of Soviet Russia to lay the groundwork for the modern United Nations, UN. On the back of the dime is a burning fasces, the rod that symbolized state authority in ancient Rome. On either side of this are two th twigs of plants, one olive, one acacia, signifying peace restraining the fires of war. Across this motif is scrawled the slogan, E Pluribus Unum, 
Latin translating as all for one. This slogan also appears on the banner held by the beak of the eagle in the front side of the U.S. Great Seal. It also shows up on the banner in the beak of the eagle in the U.S. Presidential Executive Seal. The face looking right to left in profile of George Washington appears again on the front of the quarter dollar or 25 cent piece of coin. Because of the writings on the subject by Southern Jurisdiction Scottish Rite Freemason Albert Pike, the Freemasons are often confused by anti-Masons for devil worshippers. Chief among these charges relates the statue of George Washington and his Masonic memorial to the pose of the goatfoot pan god Baphomet in this late 19th century sketch by French magician Eliphas Levy, drawn before the sculpting of Washington's bust statue. On the back of the quarter dollar or 25 cent piece coin usually appears an eagle perched on a fasces of arrows above a double olive branch with its wings downward and the familiar saying E Pluribus Unum emblazed above its phoenix feathered bald head. Contrast this symbol for the state authority of the southern jurisdiction of Scottish Rite free and accepted masonry with the symbol for the state authority that can be summoned by the northern jurisdiction of Scottish Rite free and accepted masonry. While the wings of the eagle in the south on the reverse side of the quarter are folded downward, the wings of the eagle in this logo for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, DHS, are upward and in flight. During the year 1976, to commemorate the 200-year bicentennial celebration since the signing of the Declaration of American Independence from Great Britain, the Treasury issued quarters during that year that have a different emblem on their reverse from the usual Southern Eagle motif. On the back of these, somewhat more rare and obscure quarters, minted in 1976, is a marching patriot beating a drum surmounted by the symbol of 13 pentagram stars in a circle around the burning tip of a fascist torch. As on the reverse side of all coins, we see the slogan again translated into Latin for all for one. The last coin we shall be discussing here is the 50 cent or half dollar piece. These coins are the largest, most rare of the set of U.S. minted coins and only came into circulation during the mid-1970s. On the front is the profile, looking right to left, of 35th U.S. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, JFK. On the back side of the 50-cent piece coin, pressed by the U.S. Treasury Mint, opposite the head of President Kennedy, is the logo of the Executive Office's presidential seal in exact duplicate, displaying the exact differences between this logo and the similar logo of the eagle motif on the front of the U.S. Great Seal. President Kennedy was assassinated on November 22, 1963, in the third year of his term of office as U.S. President. Although to this day rumors and outright conspiracy theories circulate surrounding the details of his killing itself, However, the idea he died for opposing and threatening to dismantle the CIA is a commonly held belief among most Americans. There is cursory evidence placing the later 41st U.S. President, George Herbert Walker Bush, GHWB, at the scene of the JFK assassination at the time it took place. However, more than that he was apparently working for the U.S. CIA at the time, remains merely speculation to this day. It is much better recorded, however, that George Bush Sr., GHWB, was a member while at Yale University of the fraternal secret society called Skull and Bones. He is seen here posing for the annual Bonesman's Yearbook photo with the skull of the Native American war hero Geronimo, stolen by his own father, Prescott Bush, for the frat one generation before. 
Here is G.H.W. Bush Sr. posing with the surviving presidents to follow Johnson, who had been JFK's vice president, VP. G.H.W.B. stands in the middle between Nixon, the 37th U.S. president, on the left, and Reagan, the 41st U.S. president, on the right. Standing next to Nixon on the right is Ford, the 38th U.S. president, on the far left, and on the far right, standing next to Reagan, is Carter, the 39th U.S. president. Each of these men belonged to one order or another, and though they appeared to the public to be competing over different ideologies, always cooperated on how to act while on camera when they met behind the scenes off camera. In this picture of the currently living U.S. presidents, we see from left to right Bush Sr., the 41st President, Barack Hussein Obama, the 44th U.S. President, Bush Jr., the 43rd U.S. President, Clinton, the 42nd U.S. President, and Carter, again the 39th President to serve. These men are all connected to one another through similar methods as the original colonial era revolutionary Jacobins were in the lodges of free and accepted masonry. However, these men, unlike our Masonic founding fathers, serve the conspiracy that is behind the Bavarian Illuminati. Just as with the senators who killed Julius Caesar, whose face is seen here in profile again from a silver coin pressed more than 2,000 years ago, these modern U.S. presidents are all accomplices to murder after the fact, and conspirators to commit financial fraud and assume dominant control over all the planet's available resources. And just as with those infamous senatorial assassins, these men have sacrificed their honor, their names, their very souls, to become foot soldiers, pawns, in the global political chess game of modern history, on the side that plays by the rules of the protocols of the elders of Zion, and who use the symbolism of the Bavarian Illuminati, and against the side of personal liberty and personal responsibility, advocated by the Masonic founding fathers of the U.S. Constitutional Democratic Republic. Modern Politics 101A the Liberty Revolution. We can begin to study modern politics simply enough by looking at these three pillars or columns symbolizing the triple cardinal branches of a democratic republic. On the left we see the white pillar signifying Jachin to Freemasons capped by the Hebrew letter Shin for the Sh phenom. In the middle is the gray middle pillar signifying the path between the two pillars capped with the Hebrew Aleph, the letter equivalent to the English A. On the right we see the black pillar signifying Boaz to Freemasons capped with the Hebrew letter Mem, cognate to the English letter M. The three Hebrew letters are called the three mothers in the literature of HaKabalah and they are equivalent to the three primary alchemical elements as well. Mem is salt, Shin is mercury, and Aleph is sulfur. In the Sefer Yetzirah of HaKabalah, it describes their relation as a pan of merit and a pan of liability, with a breath of air to decide between them. Here we see the symbols for the element of water below Mem, and fire below Shin, with the combination of them into one glyph, signifying the Star of David, representing the breath of air. However, what, one might yet well wonder, have these three pillars and their strange-sounding attributes from arcane, occult mystery schools and secret societies have to do with the basic structure of modern political government? Besides being able to be symbolized also by the three primary types of column brocade, Ionic, Doric, or Corinthian, these three pillars have very little meaning to far too many people, even those who have sworn an oath to uphold these pillars. 
These three simple vertical pillar or column symbols signify the three core branches of government in a democratic republic. The Congress, up the left, is comprised of twin branches, the Senate and the House of Representatives. The administrative branch, in the middle, is divided, likewise, into a presidential and vice presidential office, each with its own unique set of rules and duties. The judiciary branch, down the right, is divided likewise into a single Supreme Court over a series of smaller district circuit courts. These are the three branches of government in a democratic republic. Now I will briefly explain how each functions. The Congress is comprised, or is supposed to be comprised, entirely of democratically elected officials. The two houses comprising this electoral body are the senators, elected every four years, and the congresspeople of the House of Representatives, elected every two years. Here we see the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., home of these twin houses of Congress. Most of the senators and congresspeople of the United States Democratic Republic form of government are noble public servants who seek to better their world through service to a higher cause. However, there are times when many, even a majority in both houses, can be bought out by a third-party corporate interest. Because there are an even number of members in the Senate and the House each, the result of such corporate purchasing of votes can, and often does, lead to stalemates on key legislations. The Congress plays the following simple roles on the federal level of the U.S. Democratic Republic. Congress makes laws and approves or vetoes presidential appointments. Two senators are elected per each of the 50 states, totaling 100 senators. The numbers of Congress people elected to represent each state varies depending on the population of the state. Next, we come to the executive or administrative branch, central to the three pillars form of government established as the foundation of the U.S. Democratic Republic. The elected chief executive, the U.S. president, has a state-owned residence on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. to serve as their headquarters and base of operations during the duration of their elected term. It has only been recently that the number of four-year terms a single person can serve as president was limited to a total of no more than two consecutive or back-to-back -back terms. The role of the executive branch is to sign and pass or veto and reject the laws proposed as bills by the two houses of Congress. They also have the power, according to the Constitution of the USA, to pardon criminals and appoint federal judges. The executive administration, including an elected president and VP, along with the president's cabinet of appointed officials, serves terms of four years each and can only be elected into office two times in a row. Finally, the last column or pillar of a democratic republic form of government is the legislative or judicial branch. The Supreme Court of the U.S. has nine lifetime serving chief justices who serve a term until they die, are fired, or retire from office. Here is the Supreme Court of the United States Building in Washington, D.C. Inside these halls of justice are decided causes regarding the constitutionality of laws and cases seeking to appeal for overturning prior rulings of lesser courts. The role the Supreme Court plays in the democratic republic form of government is as a check and balance with the other two branches, the congressional and executive. Just as only certain duties can be performed by one branch of government, so too can others be performed solely by another, and so on and so forth, such that all the player pieces in the figurative political chess game remain constantly in check against all others. This delicate political equilibrium is called democracy. Thus, the three branches of a democratic republic form of government all equally support and counterbalance one another. 
Aside from providing calisthenic resistance that keeps pressure on each and keeps all those within these three branches from becoming overly powerful through extraction from another of the right to have power over them, the three branches of a democratic republic form of government are parallel lines that do not intersect. The founding fathers, who were also Freemasons, were quite clever and fully aware of the impact and significance of such a three-branched system of government. Thus, they drafted three documents, each of which serves as a guideline to one of the three branches of the Democratic Republic U.S. federal government. The first document our founding fathers wrote was the Declaration of Independence by the American Colonies from Great British Rule. The Declaration of Independence boldly and in no uncertain terms airs the list of American colonial Freemasons with rule by the tyrant King George III, comparing their contemporary situation to the reformation of Martin Luther when he nailed his list of his 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany over 250 years before. At least 15 of the 26 co-signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. The American colonialist Freemasons' second order of business was to create a form of government, from scratch, that could fulfill all the requirements necessary to achieve prolonged national sovereignty in the form of conducting international trade and commerce in accordance with the agreed-upon preconditions for statecraft. The Constitution establishes the three branches of a democratic republic as the foundation for the government of the USA, and sets copious limits on the duties and ex officio rights that may be taken on by each. Considering it was written by sovereign individuals, who could very well have left the whole endeavor to go to anarchy, and considering it attempts to achieve the idealist goal of democracy, a goal not sought since the end of the Roman Republic when Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon and was declared Imperator for life. Twenty-eight of the forty signers of the U.S. Constitution for a Democratic Republic form of government were Freemasons. The next piece of paper these American colonial Freemasons set about drafting up was meant as a list of laws protecting any and all sovereign individuals from abuse of state authority by any government official. The amendments to the Constitution are continually written up, vetoed, or added to this day. Because it remains a document capable of revision and change, aside from in its most core functions, some claim the Bill of Rights serves as an open door for making constitutional amendments. The Bill of Rights is originally a list of inalienable human rights given to us by our Divine Creator that must be upheld and protected by any form of state copying this model of democratic republic government. Protected by the U.S. constitutional government are the rights of free speech, free practice of religion, and free right to public congregation. Further protected is the right to own guns, mentioned explicitly in the Second Amendment as a necessary precaution to allow the citizens to guard themselves against government excesses or abuse of state authority, the right to own property in the form of land, goods and services, including intellectual properties such as writings and records, are expounded upon as well. And more rights can be added to this list indefinitely in the form of additional considerations of what constitutes human rights. All these concepts spring forth fecundly from the three branches model of a democratic republic form of government. Aside from lacking odd numbers of elected officials in most of the governing bodies, aside from the nine-member Supreme Court, the only thing that could be wanted more from this model is direct democracy, whereby the citizens themselves would cast the total number of votes not only for elected representatives, but also on political issues such as the ratification of bills into laws or overturning of Supreme Court decisions, ratifying constitutional amendments, appointing officials such as the presidential cabinet, etc. This concept of even further extended democracy depends, however, on limiting the authority commanded by each of these offices and thus the powers of them all. 
The three-branch model of a democratic republic form of government is an ingenious invention that can effectively limit the scale and scope of state authorities' invasion into the sovereign individual's personal life. By having three parallel systems that support one another rather than any other branch additional to them, but that otherwise do not intersect, the system of checks and balances proposed in the Declaration of Independence laid out in the Constitution and further delineated by the amended Bill of Rights, works to create a form of government capable of sustaining a populist needs as well as satisfying their creative impulse towards self-government. The three branches, pillars, or columns of this form of constitutional government date much further back than the Senate and Plebeian Council below Caesar, and even further than the democratic reforms of the great Greek lawmaker Solon, they date back to before the original Hebrew alphabet of symbols was first written and to before the meanings of the alchemical elements were known. The essential elements of the three-pillar model are the same as those of the scale with, as stated by Sefer Yetzer of Kabbalah, fire as a pan of merit, water as a pan of liability, and man as the breath of air deciding between them. Not to put too trite a head on such an important point, but the scales of justice, symbolizing the role of lawyers, judges, and jurors to weigh the good and evil traits of a suspect before convicting them of their accused crime, could not be a more clear and accurate symbol for this three-branch model for a democratic republic form of government. The scales of justice, likewise, give forth to the myriad texts of the Latinesque tongue called nowadays legalese. The sheer number of law books written in this peculiar and uniquely American language can stump the mind and confound any soul opposed to such a massive collection of documents that yet require constant rewrites and edits. Yet these law books in this neologistic dialect called legalese are even more copious than what even such a one who would be opposed to such can imagine. There are law books upon law books, and each changes every year. The old records remain stored and filed away. The result of this is what is called history. The records of a society's changes over time, and allows one to pursue what is called a paper trail, to track down the source of any replication of error. The number of these law books would be sufficient, if bricks, not books, to build a mansion of a house for every lawyer, judge, and juror. Likewise, the number of redundant records describing the laws in books from past years, which law books have been changed out for currently new ones by now, can astound the mind of one who sees such a pursuit as folly with the sheer volume of its apparently useless data. The walls of our society are made of law books. Here we see some stacks from the official cataloged collection of the Library of Congress, which contains no fewer today than 32 million cataloged books and other print materials. The books in the Library of Congress include a myriad of works besides just law books. However, the law books comprise the U.S. legal code and thus are the most important ones for the individual lives of citizens living in the USA. The Library of Congress is a castle comprised of books instead of bricks, where each foundation stone conceals words describing all the tools of the craft needed to reconstruct the entire edifice. The legal code of the U.S. is a brilliant monster that cannot be defeated by any one individual outside the office of the U.S. Presidency. The Library of Congress reading room's domed ceiling arches upward dozens of feet above the floor to symbolize the holy silence of all libraries since the monastic era when scroll collections began to be stored by friars and holy orders of secluded scholastics. The feeling of floating like an angel inside libraries is not a new feeling to those who love the books they contain. The Library of Congress is a unique and blessed holy place that contains the history and laws of the entire USA. Without the Library of Congress, the rest of government could not long continue to function, 
nor would it have much purpose left to do so. But why must this enormous, ornate architecture structure, the Library of Congress, be built up to be so important to the functioning of the three-branched form of a democratic republic government? It is because if law books are seen as useless, then how much more so would be our baseless fiat paper cash money? The Library of Congress is the true seat of power in a democratic republic such as the USA. However, the Federal Reserve Central Bank threatens to repossess this all if we do not pay them the interest the government owes on its national debt to the Fed Bank in the form of an annual, arbitrary, and unconstitutional direct income tax. The Federal Reserve Bank and the shadow government it funds bear being brought to the light of public scrutiny in a democratic republic because they commit monetary crimes against the U.S. citizens so constantly. Although, constitutionally, the Fed should not exist in the first place, at present, we the people of the U.S. are not even allowed to know how the Federal Reserve Central Bank is spending the money it collects from us through direct taxation. Thus, the Fed remains today, in 2011, the greatest threat to personal sovereignty on the planet. Modern Politics 101b New World Order, Monetary Imperialism As we have now seen, the U.S. Constitution specifies three branches for the government of the American Democratic Republic. Regardless of not being officially sanctioned by constitutional law, corporations, using maritime laws to supplant common law, have managed to rewrite a great number of laws into forms that favored them more. This unconstitutional influence on politicians and political parties by corporations via lobbyists and special interest groups forms a fourth branch of the modern U.S. government. As if all our founding fathers' worst nightmares came true, this fourth branch has gradually incrementally encroached on our individual sovereignty, edging ever onward inch by inch until finally speeding up for the killing lunge at the last possible second. The fourth branch can be called corporate cronyism, but in truth it is a fascist conspiracy. By buying large legal firms, funding political action committees or non-governmental organizations, and directly lobbying to politicians, private sector corporations can benefit from tax evasion law loopholes, big bank bailouts, lax oversight, and generally influence the creation or conclusion of laws to suit their benefit. How do they get away with it? Mostly it is hidden from the public entirely. Corporate buyouts are considered trade secrets until officially announced, and foreknowledge of this leading to trading of their shares beforehand can get you pinched by the IRS for insider trading. Likewise, the Federal Reserve Central Bank serves to launder all the private corporate money that is granted without binding legal contract to these research and development companies by the U.S. Department of Defense as the black ops part of the U.S. federal government's annual budget that remains classified for national security purposes. This is the whole financial circle jerk today, between, on the one hand, the Federal Reserve Central Bank issuing grants to private sector companies on behalf of the shadow government alphabet soup agencies of the U.S. intelligence community, but hiking up our rates on the amount of interest already owed for the so-called national debt, money loaned by the Fed to the U.S. government to pay for social works programs, and on the second hand, the private corporations themselves, unanswerable to any federal oversight agency, being granted limitless funny money to do R&D work for the U.S. DOD. One hand doesn't even know what the other is doing but each ends up washing the other clean. The Federal Reserve has been robbing Peter to pay Paul since its inception in 1913. There is no law in any U.S. code, any law book, any legal contract, nor any secret yet binding constitution or treaty 
that states explicitly we are required to pay any income tax to the IRS. Money taxed from U.S. citizens goes to pay back the interest on the national debt owed by the federal government of the U.S. to the Federal Reserve Private Central Bank. The result of this unnecessary tax on U.S. citizens' income has been the devaluation of the dollar at the hands of the Fed. We are currently living in economic conditions worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s. The dollar's value since 1913, at the time the Fed was founded, has lost 99.9% .9 of its purchasing power. Our fiat paper cash, if measured by the gold standard, would not even be worth burning. Because the amount of money spent annually by the federal government on social works programs is roughly equal to the amount collected annually by income tax. It appears to many as though, as long as government expands social works programs, it would also have to raise taxes. However, foreign wars waged in the name of U.S. and allies' national security and given a blank check because they are paid for directly from the Fed without having to pay the Fed back, while the money the Fed withdraws from its accounts to give to the federal government for its social programs is only a loan, and with a steep interest rate attached as well. The Federal Reserve Bank holds in its accounts all the U.S. gold reserves in Fort Knox and other military base guarded bank vaults around the nation, and probably a great quantity of gold is owned by it that remains stored in the countries they purchased it from, However, for all their accumulation of gold, they have failed to make the dollar act like gold. Still, the Fed continues printing surplus Federal Reserve note bills and coins, and continues overspending by granting to companies and purchasing gold to reserve its hopes for special drawing rights in a mixed basket of trading currencies proposed by the IMF as the future of our modern dollar standard, where the USD currently remains the world's reserve trading currency today. The same economic situation faces the USA now as faced the Roman Republic at the time Caesar crossed the Rubicon. We live in an unsubstantiable financial overextension as we attempt to expand our national influence to far corners of the globe at the same time as trying to maintain standard of living back home in our own nation. Because it is impossible to accomplish both of these, eventually a drastic change will occur. The modern so-called Illuminati, the richest elites in the most secret planning bodies, seek to determine the course of modern history by influencing the reaction of public opinion to their implementation of radical and secret policies. These men and women who are alive now, today, as you hear these words, are robbing the world of its resources and humanity of its inspiration toward natural growth by enacting these apparently suicidal economic shock test policies. The modern Illuminati are of the same occult order as the senators who assassinated Caesar. So, on 9-11-2001, with the neocons bombing of the World Trade Center Twin Towers in New York, as on 2-27-1933, when the Nazis staged the Reichstag fire, when history repeats, do we notice? George W. Bush is often quoted for saying he is pro-dictatorship, just so long as he's the dictator. Likewise, the megalomaniacal lunatic ravings of the racist and self-hating closet Jew Adolf Hitler, who sought to become the first emperor of Germany, just as had Napoleon once longed to do for France, are, without funding, only the petty, thoughtless ramblings of a dangerous fool, but nothing more. During the eleven years the Nazis held unchallenged dominance over the German homeland's cultural development, Hitler advocated exercise and regular health tests by medical doctors for the youth of Germany. The result of his careful racial pruning was a generation of blonde-haired, blue-eyed, pale-skinned youngsters, many of whom, it turns out, were forced to have been born as twins. From the perspective of those children at that time, it may have seemed fun and fair fantasy 
in a never-ending summer camp. However, despite all the good such a rigorous lifestyle of physical fitness and diet might have offered those children in the Hitler Youth Brigades, they were also being taught to hate the Jews. The great lie of Nazism is that it was Ashkenazi Hebrews of originally Semitic descent who owned the banks Hitler blamed for bankrupting Germany following the Treaty of Versailles. This was never true. And yet now, we have the same situation occurring on American soil, advocated for by the grandchildren of Nazi sympathizers in America, and made legal by neocons loyal to the Nazi ideology. Because of a staged false flag terrorist attack on 9-11, the neocons have brought back the death camps of the Nazi-era Holocaust. Instead of diaspora Hebrews of Semitic origin now, however, we torture and slaughter Muslim Arab Semites from Palestine, Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, etc. What makes it any better now that it is the USA doing it globally compared to then when it was the Nazis concealing the Jewish Holocaust in Germany? The torture of detainees suspected enemy combatants in the war on terrorism in Afghanistan and Iraq continues to go on to this day in 2011. How has this situation in the USA now changed, if at all, from the Nazi-era Third Reich of Germany in the 1930s? With the recent highly hyped murder of Osama bin Laden, according to the information released by the White House in a raid conducted on his house in Pakistan, I would like to present you with this image of Tim Osman, the CIA body double for UBL who replaced him around the time of UBL's training with the Mujahideen. Those of you who are fans of the book 1984 by George Orwell will also know him by the name Emmanuel Goldstein. Likewise, those of you who are fans of the Bible might recognize the concept of the character of Emmanuel Goldstein being based on Jesus, just as the counterpoint character in Orwell's novel, Big Brother, was a parody lampooning our modern-day globalist equivalent of the Roman Empire. While he was president of the USA, George Walker Bush, a.k.a. Jr., did all he could do to reshape our democratic republic into an autocratic empire. He used a dubiously performed national tragedy to rally the use of the U.S. military for invasions of two Middle Eastern nations, Afghanistan on the lie of finding bin Laden, and Iraq on the lie of finding Saddam's nukes. The real motives were to allow the Bush's neocon collaborators to own the fertile poppy fields and oil-rich lands to control their mass production and distribution. To accomplish this, he repassed Hitler's Reichstag Fire Decree as the Patriot Act under the Department of Homeland Security, his own equivalent of Hitler's SS, and instituted a network of detention centers, like Hitler's concentration camps, for torturing Afghani and Iraqi POWs as suspected Al-Qaeda, meaning database, terrorists, called enemy combatants in the ad hoc military tribunal kangaroo courts who gave them mock trials. But if bin Laden were meant to symbolize Christ in this new aeon, and thus Bush symbolized the modern empire of Western civilization under himself as a great dictator, it still takes a triumvirate of three people to comprise a conspiracy. And if this terrible charade were perpetrated on us all today by the modern inheritors of the same cult formed by the Roman senator assassins of Caesar, there would still be a third person who would be needed to carry it out. Just as there was the evil head of the Jerusalem Sanhedrin, Joseph Caiaphas, who had Jesus brought before Pontius Pilate, representative of the Roman Empire in Judea, to execute him as a terrorist cult leader. Riding his name on the coattails of popular dissent following Bush's unpopular foreign war on terrorism came a relative political unknown, a freshman senator, to achieve the highest office of power ever in the land of the free from its last holder, the great dictator, George Bush, Jr. 
with moderate popular support for his own platforms and extreme popular support for his opposition to Bush-era nation-building, the 44th President of the USA, Barack Hussein Obama II, has pushed through his own highly unpopular reforms, including financing Bush's final straw, the massively unpopular and treasonous bank bailout of 2008, and expressed surprise when they are met with resistance when offered in the form of health insurance reform, while simultaneously he has continued all the Bush-era policies he opposed in his campaign. And now he has had Osama bin Laden murdered. Don't worry, kids. This picture isn't really of a badly beaten, decapitated head of Osama bin Laden. It's a forgery of such, released by Pakistani ISI via Israeli Haaretz Media Wire, subsequently debunked by the CIA as only a computer collaged hoax. But then, what more was Osama all along? He was interviewed on the CBS News show 60 Minutes prior to 9-11 in the infamous Declaration of Jihad on America speech. However, following 9-11, he repeatedly denied any personal involvement in it. The concept of a terrorist network named Al-Qaeda, referring to a CIA database tracking former Mujahideen trainees under bin Laden, was invented in the days following 9-11. The FBI constructed fake IDs for the alleged hijackers using pictures of people who were still alive and well, living as citizens in various Middle Eastern nations. The 9-11 Commission report resoundingly accused bin Laden's al-Qaeda of the crime. However, regardless of how many countries Bush invaded, supposedly hot on his trail, bin Laden managed to evade all attempts at capture or even official declaration by the FBI of his having any involvement in 9-11 during Bush's entire eight years in office. It fell on the shoulders of the next president, Barack Hussein Obama, to finish the job for Bush Jr. On May 1st, 2011, Osama bin Laden was declared by U.S. President Barack Obama to have been killed in a U.S. raid on his city house in Pakistan. On the same date, eight years before, then-President Bush Jr. made his Mission Accomplished speech. On the same date, 66 years before, Adolf Hitler was announced dead over Allied radio airwaves, ending World War II. On the same date, 120 years before, May Day was declared Labor Day to honor workers slain for belonging to labor unions. On the same date, 235 years before, the Bavarian Illuminati was established by Adam Weishaupt and the U.S. Declaration of Independence was signed. On the same date, 304 years before, Great Britain was formed from Scotland and England by the Act of Union. May 1 has long been held as the first day of summer and was celebrated by the pagan druids of pre-Christian Europe until the Dark Ages. The problem with the triumvirate conspiracy creating myths is that they are using real people as their basis. Who, for example, was Osama bin Laden? Who, for that matter, is Barack Hussein Obama? Osama bin Laden was born March 10, 1957. This picture, provided by someone claiming to be a son of Osama bin Laden, Omar, to American author of pro-war propaganda books John Sasson, purportedly shows Osama bin Laden at Oxford. He's the one on the far right, according to their joint memoirs, but there's one problem. Bin Laden was never at Oxford. He allegedly attended al Thagir Model School, a secondary school in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, from 1968 to 1976, when he began King Abdulaziz University, founded in 1967 and converted to a state university in 1971 in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. According to suggestions made by some reports, he might have earned a degree there in either 1979 or 1981. It is known, however, that by the time the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan on December 24, 1979, 
Osama bin Laden was already training in the Mujahideen under the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, CIA. Barack Hussein Obama Jr. was born August 4, 1961. This picture is from the senior yearbook of Obama's high school, Punahou Private School in Honolulu, Hawaii. It is captioned Barry Obama because at that time Barack went by the nickname Barry. His friends at that time knew him as Barry Sotoro, after his Indonesian stepfather Lolo Sotoro. The reason that Obama's birth certificates have been called into question is not entirely clear, as it is unknown who originated the rumors that he was not a naturalized U.S. citizen. The reason it can be questioned, however, is simple. Obama and his mother traveled to Indonesia shortly after his birth, and Obama did not return to live in Hawaii again until 1971. He moved to Los Angeles, California in 1979 to attend the private Occidental College, largely funded by grants and scholarship donations by Rhodes, Truman, Watson, and Fulbright Scholarships and the Carnegie Foundation. In short, while Barry Obama Satoru Dunham, the future president of the USA, was entering Occidental College in 1979, Osama bin Laden was a Mujahideen soldier training for the CIA. In this picture, we see an early picture of Osama bin Laden with Shbignu Brzezinski, author of The Grand Chessboard, following the Sour Revolution of April 27, 1978, when Brzezinski, then serving as National Security Advisor to 39th U.S. President Jimmy Carter, trained Osama and the other Afghani rebels prior to the Soviet invasion in Operation Cyclone. During the presidency of 40th U.S. President Ronald Reagan from 1980 to 1988, funding for the Mujahideen from the U.S. CIA reached levels of $600 million per year. Soviet troops finally withdrew from Afghanistan on February 12, 1989, but CIA funding and training via their Pakistani counterpart, the ISI, for the Mujahideen continued, and by 1992 they had recruited over 100,000 insurgent jihadists and invested funds in excess of 20 billion U.S. dollars toward making them into a professional army. Osama bin Laden's code name in the CIA was Tim Osman. Meanwhile, Barry Satoro, now calling himself Barack Obama, transferred from Occidental College to Columbia University in New York City, following a brief vacation in Indonesia in mid to late 1981. By 1983, he had earned a BA degree in political science with a speciality in international relations. By this point in his life, he was already well established and his serving as the first black president of the Harvard Law Review in 1990, graduating magna cum laude with a JD degree from Harvard Law School in 1991, and returning to Harvard as a lecturer from 1992, earned him a spot on the 40 Under 40 Powers to Be list published by Crane Chicago Business in 1993. By 1997, Barack Hussein Obama, the mulatto from Honolulu, was serving as the Illinois State Senator. He served as such until 2008, when he was elected the 44th President of the USA, the first man of non-Caucasian complexion to serve in that office. And although that fact is irrelevant to his credentials, a great many of those voters who elected him did so solely for that reason. On October 9, 2009, Obama was crowned the Nobel Peace Prize Laureate, countermanding the Title of Nobility Clause of Article 1, Section 9 of the U.S. Constitution for promoting a new climate in international relations. During the third and final presidential debate held on Wednesday, October 15, 2008, the Democratic and Republican Party candidates supposedly rivals, shook hands with one another following their mutually voting into law the massively unpopular bank bailout bill 
proposed in the final days of the Bush Jr. administration called the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008 and enacted as Public Law 110-343 and the Troubled Asset Relief Program, the TARP Fund, on October 3rd, 2008. This plan authorized $700 billion of U.S. taxpayer money be allocated by the government to the private Federal Reserve Bank so that it could buy out all its smaller member banks under the FDIC system. This event ended the Bush administration with a bang and passed their baton of fiscal and monetary responsibility on to Obama who immediately continued it with his American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of February 17, 2009. As the Republican John McCain and Democrat Barack Obama shook hands and congratulated each other on their both having voted for TARP and the bank bailout bill, the New World Order subtly declared its victory over the American political system. And now that Barack Obama has been the 44th U.S. President for three of his four-year term, this former Harvard Law Lecturer on Constitutional Law has upheld the Draconian Patriot Act, maintained the DHS, left open the detention centers, as well as expanded the war on terror into Pakistan by using drone planes to bomb civilians there, as well as by dropping bombs on Muammar Gaddafi's private residence in Tripoli, Libya, during U.S. military implementation of a U.N. resolution to establish a no-fly zone over Libya. And now, he has murdered Osama bin Laden. He has reduced the office of one president to the role of slave to the one before. His own political initiatives represent a sham Democratic Party line, a form of unified neoliberalism that was at the heart of the big government under the Bush-era neocons all along. This neoliberal big government is a global government run by allowing an unelected, secret, rich elite to control the U.S. military and media. And now that Barack Obama, the new big brother poster child for the elite's statist empire, has announced Osama bin Laden, a veritable Emmanuel Goldstein foil to the two-faced U.S. presidents, has been murdered, that the terrorist mastermind and criminal genius who carried out the most brutal attacks ever on American soil is dead, will he reverse the Bush-era war on terror? Will he dismantle the DHS and close the death camps? The CIA could have killed bin Laden at any time following 9-11 but they instead allowed him to live in peace for a decade. He was only killed to boost the neocons' own stocks and ratings. Before 2012, Barack Obama must face a deep personal choice as 44th President of the USA. Does he want to continue on maintaining the status quo, as he seems to still be doing now, or does he want to deliver on his campaign promise of bringing change, real change, to the status quo of business as usual among the wealthy elites. Although the burden is on him to change his own ways first, it will be the fault of we, the people, if we continue, as though stunned by a car wreck, to watch him fail and to give him second chance after second chance, hoping beyond hope he will change, yet ultimately unable to make him do so ourselves. When you go into the voting booth next year, in 2012, the age of the Mayan apocalypse, you will also have to make a choice. Your choice is easier than the moral when facing every president. Your choice will be simple, a vote for one person to be president for the next four years until you vote again next time in 2016. Who you pick personally will only matter in the end if your candidate wins. But whether your candidate wins or loses is ultimately irrelevant compared to the fact that you must vote with your conscience based on your own moral principles and ethical beliefs for the person you more than just think will but also whom you think should win and whom you think if they do win would deserve their victory most. If you keep voting for the New World Order, then the New World Order is all you will ever get. 
The New World Order candidate is not the lesser of two evils. They are liars, traitors, and deserve to be imprisoned for life or executed for treason. If that is who you support, you should not vote at all, ever. Our Democratic Republic is not part of your grand chess game. The U.S. President is not merely a stepping stone to wealth and power in some behind-the-scenes elitist cabal. It is a sworn duty to protect and uphold the Constitution of the USA. If you as a citizen cannot take seriously your duty to vote, you will not be able to elect a president who takes seriously their duty to that oath of office. Personally, I'm voting, just as in 2008 when I had to write him in, for Dr. Ron Paul, because I know his beliefs are in constitutional government and sound monetary policies, which are values I also share.